Okay. Good morning, and okay. Good morning and welcome to the committee, uh, folks. If we could just uh, make sure that. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Education's oversight hearing on the fall 2021 school reopening protocols. My name is Mark Traeger and I am the chair of the Committee on Education. I'd like to thank the Chancellor of the Department of Education, Misha Porter, and the Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Choksi, folks, for being here today to provide testimony and to answer council member questions on this very important topic. I also just want to make sure that we reinforce uh, some of the count city councils uh, as an institution, our mask policies, even during stated meetings, folks are required in the city council here to wear masks and that applies here today uh, at this hearing as well. Uh, I'm gonna, can folks hear me now? Okay. Uh, I would just ask for folks' attention please because this is, this is really important for the public, for families, for parents, for educators, students, to get critical information as schools reopen in just a f under two weeks. So it's really important that we get this critical information out to the public. And, and right now, folks, please. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure if folks are not complying with, this is really, really important and so timely. I am going to, in the interest of time and just make sure that we move things along, I am going to forgo my opening statement and just, first of all, emphasize to the Chancellor, to the Health Commissioner, and to their teams that the City Council, we might not always agree and might not see things eye to eye in every item, but we don't question your heart, your sincerity, your commitment to making sure that we do everything that we can to keep our students, our staff safe, in our school communities. And there's be areas of some disagreement here today, but I, I don't question your commitment and your leadership, and I do acknowledge the incredible amount of work and time your teams have been putting in uh, to make sure that we keep our school communities safe during these very trying circumstances. And the questions that, that, that we have today, that I have today, sorry, this committee has today, the overarching questions, whether the plan that we have before us, is this the best that we can do? Is this a living document? Um, are we effectively balancing the health and safety of kids and staff while also meeting the instructional needs of kids who need incredibly amount of support, especially during this time? and after what they've went through during this past year. And are we effectively communicating with school communities? Because over and over again in my conversations with school communities, there's been a, a major communication gap. And these are some of the big items that we will address. To date, I believe that the plan that we have before us needs to go much farther. We need to go much farther to provide more flexibility and support to our kids and school communities. I am in support of a, of a remote option for families. I'm in support of providing additional uh, 
options, and, and, and quite frankly, in my research with NYSET, the New York State Education Department, they too have actually encouraged school districts, not required, but encouraged school districts to explore remote learning opportunities where it does meet the best educational needs of kids. So this is not just unique here, this is actually guidance that comes from New York State and other localities across the country are considering similar options. So I'm gonna pause here because I wanna to turn to uh, my colleague who has done an incredible uh, job and his leadership on public health issues in New York City during this pandemic has been exemplary and I thank him. Uh, please I'll turn it over now to the chair of our health committee, my colleague, council member Mark Levine. Chair Traeger, thank you. Thank you for your outstanding leadership of this committee over the last almost four years, and in particular for everything you've done to fight for schools during this pandemic. Really grateful for your leadership and your partnership. And it is great to see the administration here. Chancellor Porter, wonderful to see you. And uh, Commissioner Dr. Chakshi, also really wonderful to see you and, and all of your teams here today. Uh, 18 months into this pandemic, this is still a fast-moving crisis. So where is our city on COVID as of today? Where are we in our battle against Delta? Well, we're averaging over 1,800 newly reported COVID cases every day. And there are over 860 patients hospitalized with COVID as of today in our city. Now, after relentlessly increasing over much of the summer, these numbers, while still extremely high, have thankfully at least stabilized in the last two weeks or so. But make no mistake, we are almost certainly going to face a difficult fall ahead in our battle against Delta. And therefore, in the face of this threat, we must do everything in our power to protect our schools, to protect children, families, staff, communities. There are five key pillars to COVID safety in our schools. Vaccination, ventilation, masking, spacing, testing. We can't afford to underperform in any of these. But just 12 days out from the start of the school year, parents and staff still have unanswered questions on many fronts. Will DOE offer vaccination at every middle and high school? What is DOE doing to overcome vaccine hesitancy among middle and high school students and parents? Will DOE be supplying high quality masks like KF94 to students and staff? What objective standards is DOE using to, codify, to certify that ventilation and air purification are adequate in classrooms and all spaces in schools? Will this be monitored in any way throughout the school year? How will this information be shared with parents? How will DOE handle spacing in overcrowded classrooms? What if a class has more than 30 students? Why is DOE planning to test so few students, just 10% every two weeks, an amount far below what many experts are recommending and what other school systems are already achieving? Why is DOE not purchased huge quantities of rapid self-test to distribute to families for use at home, which among other things could allow for quick returns from quarantine. The purpose of this hearing is to get answers to these and many, many other questions. And I'm extremely excited for this important dialogue. And thank you again, Chair Traeger, back to you. Thank you very much, Chair Levine, for your leadership. I, I mean it. Uh... You have been really, you and your staff, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And we also have been joined uh, by uh, someone who has really also from the beginning, from the onset of this pandemic, has stood shoulder to shoulder with school communities, uh, unapologetically speaking up for the safety and well-being of our kids and staff. Much appreciated. Uh, please uh, welcome for opening remarks, public advocate, Jamani Williams. Testing. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Traeger, uh, for that uh, introduction. And I just want to thank uh, both you, Chair Traeger, and Chair Levine uh, for the leadership throughout the past year. There have been many people who have tested the political winds before they spoke out, uh, but we needed people who had strong voices, and you two were very strong voices throughout the, uh, this whole pandemic and continue to be, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Chotsky, and of course, uh, Chancellor uh, uh, Porter uh, for being here. I just want to echo some of the things that the 
commissioner said, I'm sorry, that the chair said about oh, our belief and, and understanding of your dedication uh, and, and the work that you're trying to do. So I want to make sure I'm clear that most of my um, frustration, and I can say this, is at the mayor. Because uh, there are now two different chancellors, and as uh, Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again, in my opinion. Uh, I feel like we haven't learned the lessons that we should have learned last year, and we're starting to do it again. And so I'm very frustrated about that, and I want to make sure I make clear where my frustrations are. As was mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams. I'm a public advocate in the city of New York, and I'd like to thank Chair Trager and members of the Committee on Education for holding this hearing today. On September 30th, New York City is set to open all of its 1,800 public schools for full-time in-person instruction five days a week. There will be far more seats filled than last year, when only about 350,000 students opted into in-person learning at some point during hybrid schooling, although the administration assured us that there was overwhelming support for this. While education, educators and school staff are required to be vaccinated against COVID-19, and students ages 12 and older are eligible for the Pfizer Biotech Bio vaccine, all students younger than 12 are unable to be vaccinated. Further, the highly contagious Delta variant poses a new challenge to the vaccinated and the unvaccinated alike. It is imperative that the Department of Education have a clear, transparent plan for protecting students, educators, school staff, and their families before the school year begins. The DOE should also provide a remote learning option for students and educators who do not feel comfortable attending learning in person until students of all ages can be vaccinated against COVID-19 and the Delta variant is under control. Students and educators are at risk in school buildings. At least at the beginning of the school year, this option should be there. It's easier to pull the option back than it is to introduce the option when it's needed. As we do know, there already is some remote learning available uh, for certain students, which causes even more confusion. Despite repeated, repeated requests from students and their families, there has been no formal remote option for the school year. Because all students, regardless of their ability to get vaccinated, are required to attend in-person learning. It is extremely important that schools are transparent about their safety plans and that the DOE is monitoring these plans to ensure that all possible safety precautions are taken. However, there is no policy in place to ensure that this happens. Approximately 1,500 classrooms are still undergoing ventilation repairs with no publicly set deadline for completion. Thousands of classrooms have been cleared by the DOE as having adequate ventilation for safe in-person instruction, even though they do not meet the COVID-19 standards set by federal experts or recommended by building industry experts. And at least 4,000 of these classrooms rely exclusively on open windows for ventilation. Ventilation is a key mitigation measure for preventing the spread of COVID-19 and is unacceptable with the, same amount, with the amount of time the DOE has to prepare for thousands of classrooms to be relying on open windows for clean air, especially as we go into cold weather. Many schools in New York City face a safety challenge. The DOE has long been aware of overcrowding. At least 10% of classrooms are unable to adhere to even three feet of social distancing, the standard recommended by the CDC in schools, although it's likely that four more spaces are actually required to remain safe from the Delta variant. Mass mandates in school will undoubtedly help control the spread of COVID-19, but there are circumstances in which students and educators will have to remove their masks for which there is no clear protocol, particularly at lunch. There are also some students with disabilities, such as autism, who are unable to continuously wear a mask. With the Delta variant making removing masks even for a few moments a safety risk, the DOE must provide guidance to keep students and educators safe in crowded settings. The city is shrinking its school's virus testing program with 10% of unvaccinated students expected to be tested every other week this year. With the size of New York City's student population, the plan may invite scrutiny. Los Angeles, the second the country's second largest school district is aiming to at least to test every student and staff member each week. At a time when the extremely contagious Delta variant is the predominant strain in the city, testing more students more often will protect our student education and their families. Additionally, when someone in the classroom tests positive for COVID-19, only unvaccinated close contacts will have to quarantine for 10 days. In elementary school, when one student tests positive, the entire class will temporarily switch to remote learning. However, the DOE has not provided guidance for how many positive cases would trigger a school-wide closing, which is important for schools to know prior to the start of the school year. When students have to quarantine, they will need to utilize remote learning while they're at home. Remote learning was extremely challenging for students and their families over the past two years, particularly for students with disabilities and English language learners. We do not know if remote learning has been improved in preparation for its inevitable use. Remote learning will have a greater impact than those who are unvaccinated, who are disproportionately black and brown students once again. With no updates on how the DOE is working to make remote learning better, these students will be the ones to receive the least quality education. 
we must have a remote learning option for at least the start of the school year, as the stakes are too high and our children's lives depend on it now more than ever. All students deserve an environment where they can learn with as little risk to their health and safety as possible. Of course, it is unfortunately impossible to fully guarantee that no student education will get sick, educated will get sick at their school. There is so much more that DOA can be doing to minimize the risk of COVID-19 infection. I hope that we can together protect our school community and make this school year a success. Our students and our educators have a right to feel safe and to actually be safe. And I think in certain regards, both of those things are challenging right now. And it doesn't make sense. Again, it feels like last year, the mayor wanted to be able to say he was the first person to open up the school system. Maybe he's trying to chase another headline right now when it comes to that. But I'm very concerned that we learned lessons. We shouldn't have to learn them again. This rush to open these things up without a remote option, without being able to answer all these questions makes no sense. We should minimize the risk. This didn't work out well for us last year. Maybe it will this year, but why do we need to take that risk and put people who are in the building who are all very scared and concerned? To me, that's a recipe for not being able to learn. And the people who suffer the most are the students who always suffer the most. So I'm pleading with you and by extension the mayor to reconsider, especially uh, having a formal remote option, at least for the beginning of the year. I understand most, a lot of people are never going to want to come back. I understand they're always going to want that, but we have to ease into this. We shouldn't try to swing it open like we did last year because it didn't work. And my hope is that there's a better relationship between the governor and the mayor. Uh, they don't seem to be on the same page yet on everything. Hopefully it'll at least be better than the last relationship. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, public advocate. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, my name is Malcolm Butehorn, counsel to the Education Committee of the New York City Council. Council members present, please note for the purpose of this hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning, but we will not be putting a clock on your questions. We just ask that you please be cognizant of the time and your fellow colleagues. For public panelists, when your name is called, please proceed to the witness table. We will be doing panels in um, three total. To be fair and equitable to all those wishing to testify, all public testimony will be limited to three minutes. The time clock is on the wall for your reference, and when the chime announces that three minutes is up, we ask that you please wrap up your final thoughts. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. From the Department of Education, we have Chancellor Porter, Senior, Senior Deputy Chancellor Marisol Rosales, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer, Chief School Operations Officer Kevin Moran, Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano, uh, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Teaching and Learning Larry Pendergrass, and from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Commissioner Chosky. So if you all could please raise your right hand, and due to spacing, I know you're gonna have to pass the mic around, so everyone just bear with us. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Uh, wait, uh, Malcolm, folks, please, this is really important. It's, so I, 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 I ask, I respectfully ask that we, we have some, you know, quiet and, and, and decorum here during this very important hearing. This is critical information that we all need, but folks watching the hearing as well, families, parents need. need. So I, I, I kindly ask, please, that when the administration now uh, will be speaking that we listen very carefully and respect here the people's house here in the, in the city council chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you. Respectfully, respectfully, respectfully. Respectfully, 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 I, this is, this is a hearing. This is a hearing. Folks, folks need to get critical information out. And the, listen, I am a former teacher. This, this, we, yes. I, I, this is, this is about making sure that we respect the people's house and get information out to school communities that desperately need it. So please, we ask, if you cannot abide, if you cannot abide, how, how, 
how are they getting information when you're speaking over people and, and we can't have them testify? If folks, if, 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 if these disruptions, if these disruptions continue, we'll ask the sergeant at arms to clear, to clear out the room. We're going to, we're going to remind people to keep their masks on and, you know, they need to, let's hear what the other has to say. Any questions about the other? Sorry, people who don't want to be escorted out, they're going to need to. Folks, if there's another outburst where there's a disruption to this hearing to get information out to folks, I will ask the sergeant at arms to please clear out the room there. This is critically important. And Malcolm, please continue to, to, to swear them in. Uh, I'll read the oath one more time. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I Chancellor Porter? I do. Senior Deputy Chancellor Rosales? Uh, D.C. Robinson, I do. Dr. Chen, I do. Kevin Moran, I do. Lauren Siciliano, I do. Larry Pendergast, I do. and Commissioner Chosky. Yes, I do. Uh, and Chancellor, whenever you're ready to begin. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Traeger. Oh, Chancellor, can you just press the button oh, on the sorry. mic there? Thank sorry. you. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Okay, great. Good morning, Chair Traeger and all of the members of the Education Committee here today. I'm Misha Porter and have the privilege of serving as New York City Schools Chancellor. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of Education school reopening plans and protocols. I'm joined here today by Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Commissioner Dave Choksi, as well as my colleagues from the DOE, Senior Deputy Chancellor Marisol Rosales, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Chief Academic Officer Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano, Chief School Operations Officer Kevin Moran, and Deputy Chief Academic Officers Larry Pendergast, Christina Fodi, and Mirza Sanchez Medina. From the moment I took on this role as Chancellor, I have made it clear that my priority has been a safe reopening for this fall. As an educator and a New York City public school parent, there is no more important day than Monday, September 13th. We know that our students need to be in school. For many students, the school community is the steadiest, most reliable aspect of their lives with people and resources they can count on. The evidence is clear. For the benefit of learning and development, our babies need to be back in the classroom. I wanna take a moment to reflect on what bringing all of our students back means. It means the return of math lessons and comfort dogs, of sports and reading, of school plays and friends. Simply, it is the return of New York City public schools. Last year, we were the first major district to open our doors for in-person learning and created the gold standard approach to health and safety during this pandemic that served as a national model. The multi-layered measures implemented by the DOE made schools some of the safest places to be during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we ended last year with a 0.03% seven-day average positivity rate. This year, by continuing our work, sorry. But this year, by continuing to work together and following the data, I'm confident that we will have an amazing year of safe and healthy learning for all. We know from our experiences last school year and over the summer with summer rising that what works to keep our children, families, and staff safe, and that is exactly what we will continue to do. Thanks to the stimulus funding, state support, and of course the incredible advocacy of the City Council, we have made significant new investments in our system. We are tackling head on the impacts of the pandemic has had on our children through the academic recovery plan, and new social emotional support systems. We're giving our schools the resources they need to meet students where they are in order to provide a real recovery across our schools. That will make our system more equitable and laser focused on the needs of our students. Summer Rising, our bridge to school this year was the beginning of that process. I witnessed firsthand at sites across the city what it means for parents, 
students, and educators to have an academically enriching and fun experience over the summer. I heard from students who said they wanted to be in their summarizing schools because they needed more academic help and also enjoyed getting reconnected with their peers and teachers. It's powerful to recognize what summarizing has meant to our comeback. I've said summarizing is our bridge back to in-person learning, and that's what it has been. Our students have gotten back into gear in their learning process and are now going to be able to hit the ground running in September. At the same time, it is so important to be mindful that we are re reopening to a different reality than last year, and we must continue to acknowledge the very real threat of this pandemic. Over the past several months, we've met with school leaders across the city to understand what worked last year and the adjustments we needed to make based on what we learned from our experiences. We also met with public health officials, including Commissioner Choksi, to understand the science of safely bringing all of our children back to schools. And crucially, we have continuously met with families to understand their concerns and hopes for their babies for the upcoming school year. We know how eager families are for a safe return and how difficult it can seem to get a handle on changes that are happening. So we've hosted open houses for parents who wanna come in and see their school buildings before opening day, see the schools, talk to principals, meet with teachers. We're letting them know that our schools are ready. We're also providing the information and the reassurance they need to send their children back to classrooms with confidence. That includes our recently released homecoming handbook which summarizes all the information families need on our health and safety protocols for the year while pointing them to resources for more details if they have further questions. And we will continue to conduct family forums and town halls to hear from families and ensure that they are engaged and empowered with the tools and information they need. I know that the challenges COVID poses are difficult and stressful for everyone. This continues to be very hard but I believe our multi-layered comprehensive plan for health and safety will be successful because it is based on science, data, and our own real world experience. So let me provide you with an overview of its main features. This year, we have a powerful source of protection that we did not have last year, vaccinations. These incredibly safe and effective vaccines will do so much to keep our school communities safe. To that end, Everyone who works in our schools will receive their first dose by September 27th. Every parent can be assured that the educators and school staff who work with their children every day will be vaccinated, providing yet another significant layer of protection and safety. In addition, every student over the age of 12 is now eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine and over 60% of young people ages 12 to 17 have already taken advantage of this. As the mayor will announce this morning, we are going to bring vaccinations directly to our students. During the first week of school, every single school that has students ages 12 and up will have a vaccination site in the building. That is a total of approximately 700 buildings that will safely administer the vaccine to our eligible students during the school day. And the lead up, up to September 13th, we will have vaccinations available at our borough and central offices so that employees can get their shots well before the September 27th deadline. Prevention begins at the school door with required health screenings for anyone entering a DOE building. We are asking families to submit these screenings and perform temperature checks at home on a daily basis before their child leaves for school. Any family who needs a thermometer will be able to get one from their school. And importantly, if a student or staff member is feeling ill, we're asking them to stay at home. As we announced in May, masks will be required for all people inside and outside of DOE buildings, regardless of vaccination status. Wearing a mask is a simple, effective way to keep everyone safe. Students who are not medically able to tolerate a mask will be provided with accommodations. Following CDC and state guidance, schools will provide three feet of physical distancing where possible. Physical distancing is one part of a multi-layered strategy and additional safety is provided by vaccinations, mask usage, improved ventilation, a focus on hygiene, 
testing, and surveillance by the Situation Room. It's important to remember that both the CDC and the state have emphasized that physical distancing should not prevent students from fully returning to school this year and reaping the benefits of being back in classrooms with their loving teachers, peers, and old, untold support they receive from being in person. We know the ability to bring fresh air into a room, circulate and exhaust, it is a critical part of preventing the spread of COVID-19. In order to provide full transparency to our families, the ventilation status of every room in a DOE building can be found on our website. Every DOE room in use by students and staff for extended periods of time will have fully operational ventilation through either natural, mechanical, or a combination of means. Additionally, as an added precaution, every room has two air purifiers that meet and exceed HEPA standards, and cafeterias in overutilized building schools will be provided with large units for added protection and window-based exhaust fans to provide additional air circulation. We were able to see this today at the Murray Bertram campus where we walked the halls with Council Member Levine and members of the media to showcase just one example of all the work put into our schools to make them safe for our students. Similarly, we are continuing our enhanced cleaning techniques put in place last year and will continue to make sure every building always has a full 30 days of personal protective equipment available, including masks for anyone who forgets or loses theirs. Since the early days of the pandemic, our custodial engineers and facility staff have been hard at work making sure our buildings are safe. With a year and a half of experience under their belts, they know the job and will continue that hard work this year. I am so personally grateful for their continued dedication and commitment to excellence in all of their work to keep our babies safe. Random surveillance testing provides public health experts with an important stream of information to understand the prevalence of COVID-19 in our school communities. This year, every school will randomly test biweekly unvaccinated students who have submitted consent for testing at a threshold of 10% of unvaccinated students per school population. The information from those tests and all other reports of co positive COVID-19 tests will be communicated to the Situation Room, which will continue to perform contact tracing and provide health and safety guidance to school leaders in a timely and efficient manner. We're asking all of our families to be sure to submit consent forms by the first week of school to provide permission required for those essential tests. Our health and safety strategies are built on providing multiple layers of scientifically proven prevention strategies. Last year proved to us that our public schools were some of the safest places to be during the pandemic. And with the vaccination rates continuing to rise every year, we expect far fewer disruptions to learning. For this upcoming school year, we are continuing the successful quarantine and closing policies that kept our schools safe during summer rising. Specifically, with com confirmation of a positive case, we will move to close a classroom and quarantine close contacts for 10 days. Fully vaccinated individuals will not have to quarantine as long as they are asymptomatic. However, those vaccinated students will be encouraged to take a COVID-19 test three to five days after potential exposure. Unvaccinated middle and high school students may test back into their classrooms out of quarantine after the seventh day if they provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test, which can be uploaded to the DOE vaccination portal. A school will close if there is evidence of widespread in-school transmission as determined by the Situation Room and the Department of Health. This approach was incredibly successful throughout the summer. We want our children in school every day, and these measures have proven to keep them safe. These policies combined with vaccination rates that are climbing every day will lead to far fewer disruptive closures than we had during the last school year. While quarantining, learning will not stop. Our educators have over a year of experience teaching both online and in person during a pandemic. For elementary school students quarantining, live online instruction will be provided. 
middle and high school students in partial classroom closures will receive asynchronous remote instruction as well as office hours with their teachers. Providing a high quality learning environment for medically fragile students has always been a focus of the DOE. As I know firsthand from my 20 years of experience here, due to the pandemic, our pre-existing home instruction program is being expanded to include more students who need medically necessary home instruction. It can include individual in-person instruction by a certified teacher or individual and small group instruction by certified teachers through digital platforms. I know these families are concerned about the safety of their children this year, and we are intent on making this process easy and accessible. Finally, we know that there is more to health and a successful return to school than just physical safety. It has been said over and over again, but it bears repeating. Our children have faced immense trauma throughout this pandemic. To welcome our students back and with the council's help, we are building on years of investments in social, emotional, and mental health supports. That includes implementing screeners to help teachers better identify students in crisis, training tens of thousands of our teachers and staff in trauma-informed practices, and hiring 500 additional social workers to support students in communities hardest hit by COVID-19. Our school communities will be well equipped to provide the support our students need in returning to school. Our entire school system has been hard at work preparing our schools for a safe opening and a joyous homecoming for every student. I wanna personally thank every educator, administrator, paraprofessional, custodian, food service employee, social worker, school safety agents, guidance counselor, and every member of our district and central staff who are working around the clock to make this year a success. And I wanna thank this council for its continued leadership and advocacy on behalf of our schools. Together, we are seizing this moment. This is an opportunity to shift gears from adversity to recovery and from hardship to healing. In less than two weeks, we are going to have all of our children black back in classrooms where they belong, joyful in learning and reconnecting. I could not be more excited to help usher in our most important first day of school ever. Thank you for your time and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, just for the record, Chair, we just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Levine, and this is the order that questions uh, will be asked by Council Members. Levine, Brannon, Gredenchik, Dinowitz, Amprey Samuel, Lewis, the Public Advocate, Borelli, Lander, Riley, Gennaro, Miller, Brooks Powers, Feliz, and Kalos. And Chair, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chancellor. Um, some of the questions that I have here in the, at, the, at the start, uh, I'll turn to also to uh, Dr. Toxey, the Health Commissioner. Thank you as well for, for being here. Uh, just a couple of items i just like to kind of make sure that we have on the record. Uh, Commissioner, uh, the, the Delta variant now accounts for the overwhelming number of COVID cases in New York City. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, do you have an uh, up-to-date number percentage? Is it pretty much all cases? If you have a, it's virtually all cases. It's over 98 percent currently. Folks, please. Uh, there's ways to, if you agree with something, there's other ways to communicate. But we, we really need to make sure we have we have an orderly hearing. Thank you. Uh, is it accurate to say, Commissioner, uh, that the Delta variant? is more contagious to children and from children than the older variants? We do know that the Delta variant is more contagious. That means it's more transmissible. Uh, that appears to hold true across all ages. Uh, CDC currently classifies New York City as a high transmission area. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and with high community transmission, the CDC recommends that school districts take additional steps to keep students and staff safe. Is that correct? It is correct, Council Member. I'll emphasize that uh, the approach that the CDC recommends is the layered mitigation approach that the Chancellor has described. Right. Uh, and testing, 
is in schools, as we've heard, is a key part of the multi-layer uh, safety approach, particularly in high transmission areas. Is that correct? Yes, it's one of the important layers, correct. Um, consent forms to conduct testing for students were required to be signed and returned by parents, guardians, in order for their children to remain in school buildings during the last school year. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that's correct. I'll defer to my education colleagues that on that. Uh, the return of consent forms is no longer required for this coming school year. Is that correct? It is correct. And New York City schools are not permitted to test children that did not return the consent forms. Is that correct? That is correct. So question I have for uh, Dr. Choksi, please explain to school communities, certainly the ones who have reached out to me, why New York City is no longer requiring the return of consent forms to, to remain in school buildings, particularly when you have testified we're dealing with a more contagious variant than last year, and there's still no authorized vaccine for kids under 12. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I'll start by putting testing in the context that we've described, which is that it's one of the important layers of mitigation, along with vaccination, distancing, uh, ventilation, and the other um, precautions and hygiene measures, such as hand washing, and very importantly, ensuring that um, children who are exhibiting symptoms actually stay home and don't come to school uh, in the first place. Um, with respect to the survey testing uh, that you describe, uh, the purpose of, of survey testing from the public health perspective is to get a sense of uh, what the prevalence of uh, disease is in the school population. Um, and the approach uh, that we are undertaking, uh, we believe will give us um, that uh, that prevalence uh, information that's very important from the public health standpoint. So I'm hearing just, Commissioner and Chancellor, I'm just, again, we, we, keep it, we keep it real here. I'm hearing the opposite, I'm hearing opposite from school leaders. Um, what I'm hearing from is that there is, there is worry that schools will end up testing the same small group of kids each month, the same small group of kids each month who did return their consent forms which fall short of the comprehensive gold standard of protection families have been promised. What are your thoughts in your assessment of the concerns that I'm hearing repeatedly from school leaders uh, about, about that? I'll be happy to start, and, and yep. of course the chancellor should add in. Um, I do understand the concern, and it was a concern that we heard um, last year as well with respect to uh, the testing approach and ensuring that um, we were getting an adequate sample with respect to the survey testing. Uh, we demonstrated last year that we were able to estimate um, the prevalence in schools based on uh, that adequate sample. And in fact, um, we showed in uh, peer-reviewed uh, scientific research that based on that, uh, the prevalence within the school community was significantly lower than the community prevalence over the entire school year. Um, we do believe that, uh, again, you know, based on um, the changing circumstances this year, including the fact that there will be more children in school, that we will be able to accurately estimate um, the prevalence based on the approach that we have undertaken. If the circumstances warrant uh, any adjustments to that based on the science and the data, uh, of course, that will be considered um, and uh, adjusted as necessary. So what I'll say, and then I have a couple of follow-ups to that, is, you know, first of all, I, I, had, uh, I had toured the Situation Room the last school year, and I want to give a big thank you uh, to Commissioner Melanie Waraka, who uh, really has done an extraordinary job, and the entire team at the Situation Room. What I'll tell you to both Commissioner and Chancellor, that the Situation Room was really busy. They were really busy. Mm -hmm. And I'll remind the public that the majority of students were opted for remote during the last school year. So I believe at its height, somewhere around 350,000 kids might have opted for in-person at some point of the, of, of the last school year. But the majority of kids were home or uh, were learning remotely. And the Situation Room was extremely busy 
Would you agree with that assessment? The Situation Room, not only are they dedicated, hardworking folks, but was a very busy place. W would you agree with that assessment? Uh, well, first, Chair Traeger, thank you so much for highlighting um, the work of the Situation Room. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it was an extraordinary undertaking by the City of New York across multiple agencies, led by Commissioner LaRocca, as you mentioned, but involving close coordination uh, across the Department of Education, the Health Department, um, the Test and Trace Corps, uh, and multiple other city staff. Um, I'm very proud of the work that the Situation Room did last year. Um, we were one of the very few jurisdictions around the country that was able to bring to bear what the Situation Room offered. Um, and that's part of the reason that we were one of the few large school districts that, um, that were able to return students to in-person learning. Um, yes, particularly when there were higher levels of community transmission, the Situation Room um, was busy. Uh, we had ways to adjust staffing to ensure that uh, staffing was calibrated to the magnitude of the work um, that was required. Uh, Commissioner, do you have the name of the lab company that will be processing the tests? And can you speak to their processing capacity? And just a couple of follow-up here is, what is the expected turnaround time to get results? Because last school year, I got reports that in some cases, schools had to wait up to two weeks to get results, which makes the test results moot, in my opinion. Um, I, I don't have the specific names of the companies. Usually we coordinate with uh, multiple testing vendors, uh, both for our school testing as well as for community testing. Um, but I can answer the other parts of your question. We can follow up on the specific companies. Um, with respect to uh, capacity, um, New York City has a sufficient capacity for testing, again, both across our school-based testing program as well as for community testing. Uh, in fact, and again, this is due to hard work from colleagues at the Test and Trace Corps uh, and multiple other parts of city government, uh, we have one of the largest testing apparatuses, uh, not just in the country, but across the world. Um, and that has been part of what has helped to keep New Yorkers safe over uh, the last um, year plus of the pandemic. Uh, in general, our testing turnaround times um, have significantly improved. Uh, compared to, um, you know, one year or 18 months ago. Uh, and in general, most uh, test results come back within 24 to 48 hours. Right. I, I am just uh, flagging for you that last school year, I was contacted repeatedly by schools across the city, not just in my district, that the results came back, in some cases, over a week. And again, that's at a time when the majority of kids opted for remote now there's an expectation for all kids to come back. I want to make sure that there is capacity and there's timely turnaround, because I think you would agree, Commissioner, that to get results after a week, they almost become moot. Is, is that correct? Thank you, Chair. Those are important points. Um, we heard in the testimony, and I heard the mayor say this before, about the number of young people who have been vaccinated. I, I, I just want to be clear. How many New York City public school students have, uh, who are eligible to, to get the vaccine, how many New York City public school students have received uh, the vaccines up to this point? Um, I can give you the data that I have for New York City as a whole, uh, and I'll defer to the Chancellor for any additional comments. Uh, for New York City as a whole, 62% of uh, eligible children, that's between the ages of 12 and 17, have received at least one dose of the vaccine thus far, uh, and almost all of them do come back uh, for the second dose uh, to complete their, their vaccine series. That's over 320,000 children uh, across the city. Um, but, that rate is significantly higher um, than, uh, than almost any other city across the United States, and that reflects uh, concerted efforts over the last several weeks to ensure that um, all eligible children uh, have ready access to the vaccine, that we have uh, striven to build vaccine confidence among families uh, and, and among adolescents themselves. Um, and as you heard in the Chancellor's testimony, uh, we aim to push that number even higher through um, the approaches described in making the vaccine readily available before the first day of school uh, and then in the initial weeks of school but, as well. Commissioner, respectfully, uh, 
if I'm hearing you correctly, the numbers you're giving us, that could include students that go to a, a, a private school or that, and also we have kids in the school system who are over the age of 17. Um, so I'm not, who are eligible for, for, for vaccination. Do we have the number of kids in the public school system who are eligible for vaccination who have received vaccination? Do we have that number here with us today? We do not have that number here with us today, but we're in the process of collecting that information through the DOE vaccine portal. So, and, and Chancellor, I, I, we, we really appreciate that. And quite frankly, when you mentioned the portal, um, I've spoken to a number of school principals and other folks. This announcement of the portal only came recently, is that correct? Yes. Um, if a student receives the vaccine, is the student required to report this information to the school or to the school portal? They are not required to. Students are not required to. Our staff members are required to upload the information. And so, and Chancellor, why isn't there any language regarding how families can opt to communicate vaccination status with their schools in the DOE's recently issued homecoming uh, guidebook? In, it, that information is in the guidebook. In, the, I, I read it. Yep. Uh, and it talks about how to sign up for a vaccine appointment. Mm -hmm. It does not say to families, you can log on to this portal mm -hmm. to indicate vaccination status. Well, well, we'll actively review the guidebook and we can update, update it. It is a live document because we know that we're gonna to have to continuously provide updated information to families. And, and I also reviewed NYSED's guidance on this area. Um, it says administrators who maintain documentation of students and workers COVID-19 vaccinations uh, can use this information consistent with applicable laws and regulations, including those related to privacy to inform prevention strategies, school-based testing, contact tracing efforts, and quarantine and isolation uh, practices. Schools that plan to request voluntary submission of documentation status, uh, COVID vaccination status, should use the same standard protocols that are used to collect and secure other immunization or health status information from students. What, what, what I'm getting at here is that Principals are the ones responsible to implement the school protocols in terms of who has to quarantine, who has to um, uh, testing. They're in charge of the school building. Um, at this hour, they don't, many of them don't know who in their buildings have received vaccination status. And many of them that I spoke with did not know about this online portal. And I also think about families. How is this being communicated with families that they have the option to indicate that on the portal? Um, can anyone speak to yeah. the communication plan with both school leaders, school communities, and parents and families about this online portal? Yeah, and just, you know, thank you for that important question. We know how important it is to make information transparent open and clear to our amazing principals who have to implement these policies and so that our families can upload uh, um, the information. So I'm gonna have Lauren Siciliano talk to you about the vaccine portal and, and how all of that communication works. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chair Traeger, for the question. Um, just to echo what the Chancellor said, we absolutely agree that communication is essential here to make sure that all of our school communities are aware of the portal, both for staff and for students. Um, uh, a few things that I wanted to add uh, in terms of how principals will implement the protocols or how the protocols will be implemented around quarantining. Um, I wanted to make it clear that the, the situation room is the primary point for the principal who will be advising the principal based on the close contacts who needs to quarantine versus who does not. Um, while it is, of course, helpful for principals to have this information, I just want to make sure it's clear that they are not charged with knowing who is vaccinated or not in the school. The Situation Room will be making that assessment, and um, they have access to a city registry of vaccinations that they can also use to confirm who has been vaccinated. Um, but so just, just so we're clear, because this is important to get out to the public. So the, so the Situation Room will have access to a citywide registry yes. of who is vaccinated. Is that correct? That's correct. And principals will be in speaking with the situation room and vice versa. That's correct. Uh, when it comes, when it, if there's a case that has to get followed up on, 
they will know who from their school is vaccinated or not. Is, 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 that, is that right? They have that, they have that information? That's correct. They confirm that information. And are principals aware of that, aware of this right now? Uh, they, we always are trying to improve our communication. So um, I will say generally, though, that, that those were the same protocols for last year. So principals should be expecting Well, that last year there was no vaccination, but. Mm -hmm. uh, over yeah. the summer. Yeah. Uh, for, for staff. Right. Um, right. Uh, in terms of staff. So yes. Um, but that was the, the protocol since the, the vaccinations became available. And we'll make sure to continue to reemphasize that. Um, during the last school year, if a student in the building did not feel well, they were taken or they were supposed to be taken to an isolation room to be evaluated uh, by a nurse or, or, or the school's designated coordinator. Um, is that still the case uh, this, uh, this school year? Yes, that, that is still the case. Um, and we continue to ensure that we have a nurse in every school building uh, to support as needed. So just to clear answer, schools are expected to, to have a dedicated space in their buildings it, for, for an isolation room? Yes. Um, and is that, are you hearing concerns about space constraints with regards to having an isolation room when everyone is coming back into the building? We have not heard concerns about having an isolation room with folks coming back into the buildings. Um, to, to quickly follow up on this, Dr. Choksi, last year the city shifted the school closure rule from two positive cases in two different classrooms to I believe four, four cases later in the school year. What is the school closure policy for this upcoming school year regarding uh, confirmed cases and how does the city define for a school community what widespread transmission means? Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. I know um, this is also a question that's on um, many people's minds, particularly many families' minds, and I understand why. It's a good example of a place where um, we have learned from our experience over the past year um, with respect to refining our safety protocols and striking the right balance uh, between, first and foremost, uh, keeping the school community safe, uh, but also minimizing um, any disruptions in learning. And so with respect to uh, the widespread uh, transmission threshold that you're asking about, um, the brief version is that our disease detectives, um, they embark on an investigation uh, when there are multiple cases um, identified within a school community. Based on that, if there's evidence of multiple sources of infection across multiple spaces or cohorts in the school building, um, and they make a determination that there is a reasonably high likelihood that transmission is occurring within the school as opposed to uh, outside of the school in the community, um, then that would meet the criteria for widespread transmission. Commissioner, how many disease detectives do you have assigned to schools? Uh, we can follow up on the specific number, um, but again, this is dynamic based on uh, the caseload and the workload that, uh, you know, that, that we'll see. So I just want to, again, like, I, I, I it's hard to relive uh, this, but, but at the start of the pandemic, this was sort of what the city's policy was, where a school, the DOE, did not have the power to, sh to close their own schools in the beginning. I, I remember this very, very, uh, you know, it, this was right at the start and the health department had to make the call. And there were major, major communication issues between the health department and uh, local schools with regards to, and there was, so if, how can you just assure us that there is going to be much better coordination communication, in particular, how much staff will be assigned to, because principals are, have asked me this question repeatedly, because parents will inevitably call teachers, uh, students, everyone will. And, and also, I, I know what happens uh, when there's a confirmed case. And, and by the way, are, are principals required to still notify the school community uh, that there's a confirmed case in their building? Can anyone speak to that? Are principals required to, to share that information? You want to talk to that, Kevin? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, the situation room now, um, I hear what you're saying is much different than it was last September. One thing is we have additional staff, and I thank you for your advocacy. We added nearly 100 people to the Situation Room. 
uh, 84 to be exact. And those individuals are, are supporting alongside trained individuals, and more importantly, experienced individuals. Individuals that worked with principals on this intake in terms of making this very fluid. When the principal calls in, they, they give the case. Now we can start working downhill to confirm the case and then coming back with the necessary communications. If it's, if it's a classroom closure, that letter. If it's multiple classes, that letter. If it is something that goes to the fourth case and has something that is considered widespread, then that 10-day notification for closure would also be a letter that goes out. And we did over time improve the turnaround time from when a principal said, I need to make this notification, I have this case. In the beginning, we took painstaking efforts to make sure it was a confirmed case, because some instances, it didn't turn out to be true. It was someone who came from, you know, with another idea, you know, another pediatrician or something, and they didn't have a confirmed case yet. So we, we took painstaking efforts to make sure that the information we were working with and notifying school communities of was valid and confirmed by the Department well, of Health and uh, the experts. Uh, Kevin, my question, Mr. Mayor, my question was, are parents supposed to get notified when there's a confirmed case in a school? That's right. They are? Yes. Even with one case? Yes. Uh, because I'm just sharing, you know, the reality on the ground. Once there's a confirmed case, there's a lot of concern. Once there's, I went through a school in my district last school year where there were like five or six cases within a week. And there was a lot of concern, which spilled onto social media. And, and I have to feel the calls. I'm sure you, you feel the calls. So Commissioner Toxie, the concern is principals will be asked repeatedly, why, is, why isn't the building closing if there's five or six confirmed cases popping up within, uh, are they referring parents and folks to the health department to answer that? How does that work? That coordination occurs through the situation room, but with respect to the, com the interface for communication with parents and families, that will always be through school leadership. <laughs> and Chair, I'd, what I'd like to do is send you the updated uh, protocols offline after the hearing, make sure you have what our principals receive and what our situation room disseminates so you can see the flow of information, and in each case, what are those necessary steps? That I, I just, you know, I have to, I know the Chancellor mentioned the opening testimony, and I appreciated school leadership, schools, communities, they're being asked to be public health administrators, they're doing interior designing right now, moving furniture around, um, trying to make this work for kids to the best of their ability. I just want to say there, there's a cost as well here, uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm putting my teacher hat on. The more principals and school folks are working on this, that means less time on advancing an instructional agenda forward. And I just want to make it clear, you know, principals, you know, they do a lot, but the more time they're doing, whether it's contact tracing, situation room coordination, communication with families about cases, uh, this, th there's going to be a cost here. And I just, I just want to make sure that we get that. I'm going to wrap up with final question and turn to my Chair, colleague. Chair Traeger, if I, I, I just want to make sure yeah. to clarify, yeah. um, because your point is very well taken. And um, you know, our, uh, our colleagues in education, teachers and administrators, um, have borne uh, Herculean burdens. And they've really stepped up to the challenges and the demands over the past um, school year in particular. But with respect to the epidemiological investigations, um, the contact tracing that's occurring, uh, those are things that, um, that are coordinated and that are performed through the situation room. It's the school leadership um, whom we're looking to, to communicate because they have the relationships with their school community and with their family. Right, but Commissioner, respectfully, in high school, it's not easy for the situation room to determine contact tracing. I used to teach high school. The kids move to different classes with different groups of kids during the course of the day. As opposed to elementary school, where typically kids are with the same group of kids all day, it's easier to contact trace. So inevitably, someone is going to call the principal and the staff and say, can you please tell us everyone's program? Who are they with second period? Who are they with third period? I know this. And so the question is, is that going to fall on the principal and, and their team to come up with that information to share with the situation room. Is, is, that, is that accurate? There will have to be close coordination, yep. of course, between school leaders, teachers, and the investigators. And I'm just, and yeah, can please, I just yes, Chancellor. Yes. So having sat in all of those seats as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal, but also as a public school parent, you know, it, what we've heard overwhelmingly, our principals have worked so hard, as you noted, 
to get our students back in school because they know it's important and we know it's important. What this central office is working to do is also wrap ourselves around in a very supportive way around our principals so that they can do the work that they need to do to get our babies in classes, but also to make sure that learning happens. This, we're in a place that we've never been, but we also have a thing that we didn't have a year ago, which is a vaccination. And so it positions us in a much greater place to not only welcome our students back, welcome them back safely into warm, nurturing learning environments where they are wrapped around with folks who are deeply dedicated to them. And we're dedicated to the work of our principals because like you said, having sat in that seat, I know who my families wanna hear from and that's from me as the principal. And I know that the coordination with our partners at DOHMH around my building falls on me. I, I recognize that. And so our job centrally is to make sure we're pouring in all of the supports and resources to help principals do just that. And Chancellor, I, 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 I hear you and I respect everything what you said I, it makes sense to me and I respect that. It's just, I, I know having you know, uh, been in the building with a very dedicated principal, yeah. mm -hmm. priority number one was keeping kids safe and supported. This is, this is quite a bit. It is. This is quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And there's, to me, there's gonna be a cost to, you know, that's going to be one less observation that day. That's going to be one less teacher feedback, you know, a, a debriefing on, on a lesson. This is, this is going to take up a lot of time during the course of a school day. I mean, that's inevitably what happens. But Dr. Choksi, the ch Chancellor again mentioned vaccination being a key thing here. We don't have information here today about the number of public school kids who have received vaccination. This is a question that's come up to me repeatedly by, by folks. I am not a public health expert. I'm an educator by trade. You're the city's top doctor. What is your, as a medical professional and the city's top doctor, what is your view and, and, and opinion on uh, requ the requirement, on a requirement of vaccination for students in the public school system? Thank you for the opportunity to speak about vaccination. It is the single most intervention that we have in the pandemic right now, um, you know, in terms of keeping the whole city safe, um, but also in terms of keeping our schools as safe as possible. Uh, with respect to um, school staff, uh, there is the vaccine requirement that uh, the chancellor has, has described. And that goes a long way, uh, not just in terms of protecting the adults in the building, but very importantly, in protecting the children who are in the building as well. And that's the question we about saw, children. I, I, I will yeah, I'll yeah. answer that part of it as well, Chair. Um, we saw last year that uh, the majority of transmission um, when it occurred in school buildings, which again was at a very low rate, um, was occurring uh, from adults. And so that is why it's particularly important for uh, the protection of children to ensure that, um, that all adults are vaccinated as well. With respect to your question about, about children, um, you know, I'll defer to my Department of Education colleagues on the specific numbers. The 62% that I mentioned um, that is something that uh, is very important and valuable uh, for the public school community as well, yeah. because mm -hmm. we know that uh, kids, adolescents, you know, they spend time not just in school, um, but also socializing, you know, with other adolescents uh, who may be going to a different school, who may be going to um, a private school. And so that's also very important with respect to creating the protective bubble that we need and that vaccination so, affords. And, and, and Commissioner, what I'll say is that last school year, when the mayor told the public that attendance citywide was over 87, close to 90 percent, uh, we had asked for school by school, district by district breakdown. We actually had to subpoena the city, the city to get that attendance breakdown. And it showed in some of the hardest hit communities in New York City, attendance was very concerning. So. I, I hear you on the citywide numbers, but we need a lot more granular information, particularly for the hardest hit communities who continue to go through go through so much. Last question, then uh, turn to, to, Chair to, Trey, can I just yes, add to please, Chancellor. Yes, and I'm going to ask Lawrence Tilly yes. to talk about this. We're also working through the vaccine match system, right? To, eight through ATS and DOHMH to match students vaccinated who are currently enrolled in our system. Okay, thank you, thank you, Warren. Thank you, Warren, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chancellor, remote learning, yep. uh, and then we'll turn into, I apologize to my, my colleagues. Uh, can you say with certainty today that every child in our public school system from every zip code, including children in shelter, 
temporary housing has both an appropriate device and internet service. I'm confident that our, all of our students are adequately prepared with devices um, for, for um, LTE Wi-Fi enabled devices, yes. Uh, and, and that because the last year, the, the iPads, yes, mm -hmm. come with internet, and, and Warren and I, we had spoken about this, mm -hmm. but the Chromebooks did not. Mm -hmm. And many kids last year did not have internet yep. service at home. Yep. What are we, are, so, are we mm -hmm. ensuring at this moment? Is there, is there additional, yep. are, are there Chromebooks with internet service and hotspots available for kids in schools if they need them right now? So you know, we've made a commitment through all of the resources that we've received through the council, through the Federal um, Recovery Act, to ensure that our students are digital citizens. And so we've also in, we'll continued to invest in by purchasing not only the uh, um, iPads that were Wi-Fi and LTE enabled, but also Chromebooks that are Wi-Fi and LTE enabled. We also have access to um, mobile hotspots to make available to students. So, we, you know, I recognize having led in the Bronx that, you know, when we went into this pandemic and put devices in students' hands, it wasn't just about the device. It was about the access to the Wi-Fi to actually leverage the device to engage. And so that's something we made a commitment as a system to making sure every student has that level of access. And, and are you aware of any request to Central at this time of internet service or Wi-Fi hotspots or, or devices? I'll, I'll ask Lauren to speak to that. Thank you for the question. Um, so as the chancellor mentioned, we are continuing to distribute devices. We announced as part of the academic recovery plan earlier this summer that we would be distributing an additional 175,000 LTE enabled devices. Um, that is a combination of iPads and predominantly Chromebooks, um, all LTE enabled. Uh, meaning they come with data plans. We have uh, reached out to all schools to let them know the number of devices that they should expect, um, and they are letting us know what they need at the same time. And, and how many at this time, Warren, are you aware of in terms of, of the requests for devices and internet? So um, I'd need to check the numbers, but we have more than enough supply. So we are getting those confirmations and on a rolling basis and sending out the devices. And this is so that each school has enough devices um, for all of their students K to 12. So it's not that in a student, you know, immediately needs a device right now that they don't have. This is so that they will have enough supply so that at any point they would have enough for all students K to 12. They also, of course, continue to have the devices that we distributed over the past year and a half. So Warren, just to be clear, if any of our colleagues here in the city council get contacted by parents, school communities, that a child does not have internet service and a child does not have a device, you're saying that DOE has them available for that school a right there and then? Absolutely, and please continue to escalate those. We also have thousands of hotspots still available, so that if, if there are any school communities or individual students that you're hearing about that are struggling with this, we have the resources to help. Um, final thing, Chancellor, with, with regards to remote learning option, NICID actually has some language around remote learning mm -hmm. that I, I was reviewing. It talks about, while the department will not require schools that are open for full-time in-person instruction to provide online or remote instruction, districts may work with students and families to offer remote options if it is deemed to be in the best educational interest of the student. And I'll continue where it says, districts should consider the value of online capacity developed in response to the pandemic to expand programmatic offerings and to offer remote learning opportunities that are responsive to student needs. This can be done directly through cooperative agreements with other school districts or, th or through boards or, or co cooperative educational services. Um, and it concludes by saying that uh, this is for students who have otherwise struggled, uh, have excelled with remote learning. So NICE it doesn't require it. It does not say you have to do it, but it certainly says it should be at least considered and explored, uh, not just for medically fragile students, but for kids who actually have excelled. There are, I, I have heard in some cases where students have excelled in remote learning. I, I hear from some, particularly families have younger children who cannot get a vaccine at this time in my district and other parts of the city, where they're very fearful and nervous to send their kid back. Their child has asthma, which asthma is not listed, Commissioner, as one of the uh, chronic conditions, 
um, on, on the list where they, they could receive a medical accommodation. Is, is that correct? Uh, the list of conditions um, that is in the homecoming handbook for medically necessary instruction, I want to clarify, those are uh, when an application is submitted with one of those conditions, they will be um, automatically approved as long as it is, of course, a valid submission. Uh, for any other conditions, of course, a family may still submit an application for medically necessary instruction because in many cases it depends on the details and the nuances of the specific case. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so could Chancellor, just if you could yeah. answer, the, even that NICID is saying to school districts it should be at least considered. There are kids who have excelled in this area. I'm not saying that everyone, but there are kids who have excelled. Why is a remote option not on the table at this time for, for families that can request it, that so, they want to request yep. it? So I think it's also important to note that NICIT, the Department of Education, the American Pediatrics Association, the CDC, all recommend in-person learning. They all recommend that as the most appropriate way for students to learn. We know, all of us know, the best learning that happens, happens between students and teachers in person and in classrooms. And so we've leaned into what we know works best for students. However, recognize that there are families who have some concerns, which is why we looked at providing a, uh, an option for students who are medically fragile. And we also looked at this option, you know, because as a former principal who's had to have students on home instruction, that system needed to be revamped. And we've learned through this pandemic that we have multiple modes of educating students that allow us to revamp that home instruction system. And so we're offering the option to engage our medically fragile students because those are the families I continue to hear from. I continue to hear from families who have medically fragile students who are under 12 and unable to be vaccinated as a call for a remote option. And we've always had an option for those students. And so I think that this opportunity provides us with the moment that we not only enhance that opportunity, but leverage what we've learned into that in the pandemic to make it more engaging, more connecting, and keep those students who are removed from the building deeply connected to their school community. And so we will continue to lean into providing the instruction that we believe works best for students, and that is ensuring that they have the opportunity to learn in person um, with their teachers in their school community. And, and I appreciate that answer, Chancellor. And, and last thing, uh, Mark Levine will, will, will take over questioning. Um, other localities also had the approach yeah. of everyone back. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could read off a list of cities yes. that have said the same thing. Everyone back. The city of Dallas was kind of forced to make changes within the first couple of weeks because attendance was dismal. Yep. Attendance was, and it forced them to consider remote options. Mm -hmm. New Jersey, the governor very publicly has been saying over and over again, everyone back. He still says everyone back. But interestingly, his education department sent guidance to school districts across New Jersey saying, you can begin to prepare remote options if you wish to do that. So, and in the NICID guidance, it, it says that in the event of school closures, mm -hmm. schools must, not may, must have remote or some instructional plans in place. I didn't see that in the homecoming mm -hmm. guidebook about if a school yeah. closes down, this is what a school should do. Yeah. It says that school closures are determined by the health department, mm -hmm. but it does not indicate instructionally what the next steps are. So can you just let us know, are there, will there be guidance yeah. shared with school communities about that? And, and can you respond to what's happening across America mm -hmm. where folks that said, everyone back are now moving in the direction of an option should be on the table. So New York City has and will continue to be the gold standard and continue to add those layered protocols. But we are watching. We're watching what happens across the state. We're watching what's happening across the country um, because we know we have to be making decisions as we go along. We also, and our school leaders and school communities know that in the event that we need to pivot to a remote, op to remote we're prepared to do that. We learned a lot in the pandemic. That's why we want to keep technology in the hands of our students. That's why we want to continue to provide professional learning to our teachers around how we engage on remote platforms. And so we are prepared to do that. Um, we'll, we've talked in the handbook about, and we'll talk more about, 
um, in the event that we need to quarantine, what instruction will look like and how instruction will continue. And so we're not, you know, I've heard people say, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We're not doing that. We're taking this tool that we've learned and leaned into and using it to enhance and build out our system. Thank you. Sorry, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that excellent line of questioning. Uh, in past vaccination drives in the city, such as against polio, we have vaccinated in school buildings. Are we able to vaccinate against COVID in school buildings in every middle and high school? So we, I mean, the, we announced this morning, the mayor announced this morning that at our sites where we have students 12 and over, we're going to be vaccinating our students. And we're really excited about the opportunity to do that. So I'm sorry, so there was a new announcement today, you said? Yes. It, could you just repeat what the new plan is? So, so you want to talk specifically about it, Kevin? Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, part of our, we're calling it the Vax to School campaign, is to offer for willing families and willing students the opportunity to be vaccinated during the first week of school. We've looked at every single school building that services students ages 12 and up and are setting up that opportunity for families for the first week of school if they'd like to come in and to uh, Councilman Traeger's point earlier, provide information at that site while they wait the 15 minutes to upload into our vaccine uh, portal. So this will be something that is widely advertised as an opportunity by no means uh, mandatory, but it's something we're strongly encouraging based upon what we've seen thus far. Who will be doing that vaccination? We, we've contracted with agencies to come out and actually do the vaccines. And that will be all middle and high schools for the first week? That's correct. Uh, Commissioner, you cited the citywide rates on teenager vaccination. We know there's enormous variation amongst communities and amongst school communities. There's gonna be some buildings where probably 90% or more of students are vaccinated and probably some where, I don't know, maybe less than 25% are vaccinated. Do we have, uh, do you have data to identify those schools where vaccination rates are particularly low? And more importantly, do you have a plan to surge resources in those schools or change protocols uh, or make more intensive ac efforts to uh, build confidence in the vaccine? Yes, and thank you, Chair, for this um, incredibly important question because, as you've heard from us before, vaccination is the central pillar that helps us to keep students and school communities safe. With respect to your question, um, yes, uh, we, we already have some data with respect to, um, by geography, what those varying rates are. And that uh, has already helped us to target, as you well know, um, with respect to our vaccine equity efforts, how we can uh, focus resources, attention, our partnerships on building vaccine confidence in those places. And I'll just add one more note, um, as my colleagues have described in terms of the Vax to School campaign, this is something that we have already started. Um, we had vaccination sites uh, at multiple summer rising schools, uh, and we saw very good uptake uh, at those schools. Very important because, as you're pointing out, it's not just about the injection itself. It's about the converse conversations that happen around it to answer parents' questions, to answer kids' questions, uh, and to make sure that people um, are, are comfortable uh, and have access to the vaccine. Thank you. So because of the contagiousness of Delta, experts are advising uh, higher quality masks. And this can actually be hard for families to secure, uh, partly because a uh, mask like this, uh, KF94 or, or, or higher, are more expensive, but also hard to find for smaller people. Ideally, the city could provide those, and that would mean that would mean offering millions potentially over the course of the year. Do we have supplies sufficient to offer higher quality masks to all students? Absolutely. I mean, we have a, I'll let Kevin talk specifically because his team has led the work about around making sure we have PPE in our schools, making sure we have variations of PPE based on different needs of our children. But our, we also, it's important to note, 
that is not something that our school budgets are paying for. That's something that the central budget is paying for and ensuring that every school has a 30 day supply of PPE on hand every single day. But just to clarify, yep. that PPE is not, last year there, was, there were cloth masks, very basic, or uh, traditional service masks, which are also considered a lower caliber. But this year you're going to be offering higher caliber masks such as KF94, et cetera? That's correct. We currently have 30-day supply at all schools and KN95s for staff as well. Uh, currently, we have in a central location over uh, 500,000 available if a school does for some reason fall short of their 30-day supply. So they will be made available and we'll follow up specifically on the KN94s. Got Chair, if I, if I may um, just add briefly on that, um, from the scientific perspective, uh, the most important thing is to ensure that people are wearing masks consistently and properly. That means it has to have a snug fit uh, against the sides of the face, uh, optimally involves multiple layers to the mask. And just on a more uh, human note, you know, as a father of a small child, uh, sometimes it's, it's not, uh, you know, the KF94 or the KN95, the mask that a child can actually wear consistently and properly through the entire school day. So my message to parents is find a mask um, that works and that fits and that is comfortable for a child so that they're protected uh, over the duration of the whole school day. Thank you. Every expert has identified testing as one of the key pillars to safety in, public, in school buildings. And many have identified a goal of testing every week the entire school community. And there are some school systems which are at least attempting to achieve that goal in other parts of the country and world. Uh, but the city's goal is, is only 10% of the school community every two weeks, which uh, I believe is half on a percentage basis relative to uh, the standard in the past school year. So why, why, why are we testing a lower percentage of students this year, uh, given the, the greater contagiousness of Delta? Why not set a much more ambitious goal as other systems around the country are? I'm happy to start on this mm -hmm. and then uh, my education colleague should chime in. Um, thanks again, Chair, for highlighting this. First, very important for us to put testing in the context of that layered approach to prevention that we've described. Uh, it is an important layer, but it is one uh, of multiple methods that we have um, to keep kids safe. With respect to testing specifically, let me just break down some of the ways in which we have to think about testing. First, we can divide it into diagnostic testing and screening testing. Uh, diagnostic testing um, will be available for uh, every student. Um, if they're exhibiting symptoms, you know, they will have a ready pathway to ensure that they are tested quickly so that then they can get connected to the rest of the important public health interventions. That's tracing, isolation, and quarantine. Um, with respect to screening testing or, you know, survey or surveillance testing, um, what you described in terms of our approach with 10% um, every two weeks, we should think about that as a floor rather than right. a ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is, uh, is a few. First, we have the ability to strategically deploy more testing resources based on what we are finding from uh, that survey testing. The second is that uh, the survey testing is an adjunct to uh, the, the country's largest uh, community-based testing apparatus that we have. And we saw both over the last school year as well as over the summer, um, the magnitude of that testing was very, very important um, to ensure uh, that cases were found and diagnosed and again appropriately um, isolated and quarantined. And the final thing that I'll say is that um, this is an area where we will continue to follow the science and the data, and if there are adjustments that uh, need to be made as, as time goes on, uh, of course, we will make those calibrations. Look, I just want to be clear that survey testing, you're using the terms just so people understand, is helpful to get a, a sense of the trends throughout the system, very important for epidemiology. That's different than trying to put the brakes on every break, on every outbreak. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that if you're testing 10% every two weeks, which is why uh, other systems are going for much more ambitious numbers. This is an extremely resource-intensive undertaking. I get that. 
uh, the staff resources, the lab resources, the logistics. But to me, that argues for uh, planning from now to go really big, uh, not waiting to see how the year goes. But I do want to ask about um, rapid testing, self-test kits, which can be used at home. Uh, these are uh, much more than they were at the start of last school year, uh, uh, widely available, and the prices come down uh, considerably. Uh, today is the first day of school in Israel, and they have given all two and a half million kids uh, a home test kit, a self-test kit, uh, that they are to use before the first day of school, uh, which is a very powerful screen before people come together in person. Uh, why can't the city acquire millions of these kinds of, tit, of kits, use their bulk buying power, and, uh, and give these to families to use, uh, uh, not, not to give an epidemiological view of the trend, but to stop outbreaks before they spread? Thank you for, for this important question as well. Um, our city's test and trace core uh, does employ at-home testing already, particularly when close contacts are identified. Um, those at-home testing kits uh, are provided for them. What you're describing in terms of the approach in Israel and other places um, is something that we are following closely uh, with respect to understanding, um, you know, scientifically uh, whether there is additional benefit uh, from that approach, um, and it's something that, uh, you know, that we can consider uh, with respect to our uh, testing approach. But very importantly, um, I don't want people to leave with the impression that we don't have uh, a version of that already. We do through our massive community testing apparatus, which is readily available um, to families, including to children, and which has been vitally important with respect to breaking the chains of transmission over the last school year and over the summer. Um, that is something that is free of charge uh, for all families, um, which we know that people are availing themselves of, but importantly, has to be put into that broader context, both in terms of connecting testing results to contact tracing and isolation and quarantine when appropriate, as well as testing as one part of the multiple layers of prevention that we've described. Right, but the system right now relies on people leaving their home and going somewhere, and potentially, if they're at the wrong site, waiting in line. And that's just not realistic if it's going to happen continually on a massive scale for families. And I, 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 experts have also uh, suggested that this could help speed the return from quarantine, that you could even have a default, that if you are getting rapid test negative, that even on the first day you could return because the rapid tests are good at uh, assessing contagiousness. I'm not in a position to evaluate the science of that, and this isn't the place to do it. But there, there clearly are uh, vast new opportunities opened up when testing uh, is done uh, on, a, on a home base, uh, as it is in, in other parts of the world. Um, I, I, I want to move quickly so we can uh, just get to other uh, members. Uh, our school nurses are more important than ever. Uh, and we've had a struggle to secure uh, full-time permanent hire nurses in every school building, in every school. Uh, and that has meant that we have often had to resort to uh, temp nurses or contracted nurses would be a more appropriate term, sometimes that travel between buildings. Uh, can, can we ensure that we have a full-time uh, permanent nurse in every school uh, beginning uh, on, on the first day of school? Yes, we, you know, I, listen, as a principal, I remember that struggle. And in this, time, this, this moment and in these times, having a nurse in every school building is more important than ever. And so we've worked to ensure that we have that in place and that we have it in place from day one. Thank you. Uh, fi finally, um, the question of how close contact is defined uh, leaves a great deal of room for interpretation. And the CDC has offered very specific language about that. And uh, how broadly or narrowly you define the close contact, uh, if there's a case in a given classroom, for example, uh, impacts uh, enormously how many kids are sent home. Uh, could you explain how, how we're defining close contact and the extent to which there's any difference between how CD, the CDC defines that? 
Um, certainly, we're, we're defining close contact uh, as an exposure of a duration which makes us think that someone is at higher risk um, of developing the infection. Uh, generally, that means there's uh, at least you know, 10 minutes uh, of exposure um, within uh, three to six feet of another uh, individual. Um, this does depend on vaccination status as well. So even if someone is identified as a close contact, but if they are fully vaccinated, um, then they are not recommended for quarantine in that case, although we do recommend uh, that they get tested within three to five days of that exposure. Um, and it, it depends, as you're pointing out, on the specific circumstances um, within the school building. Uh, we have taken a, a more protective approach than uh, some of what is laid out in the CDC guidance uh, with respect to um, unvaccinated individuals, uh, particularly, for example, in elementary schools where uh, children are not yet eligible for vaccination, where if there is an exposure, then the recommendation is, them, is for them to quarantine for 10 days. But if, if a child tests positive, uh, would another student who sits far across the room from them be identified as a close contact and therefore need to quarantine? If they are in the same classroom, um, yes, because usually, uh, you know, the, the real world of classroom dynamics is such that uh, exposure is likely to have occurred. Uh, there may be some nuances depending on specific circumstances, but in general, yes, they would be considered a close. So is it correct to say that we have a slightly more, I guess, conservative definition of close contact in the CDC guidance? Uh, this is one of the areas where we believed it was important to be more protective than the CDC guidance recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chancellor. And back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, th Chair, again, for your leadership. I know that Councilmember Lewis uh, ha had a, a pressing, pressing question. Is that correct? Thank you, Council Member, for letting me go before you. Thank you so much, Chairs Traeger and Levine, for organizing today's hearing. Thank you, Chancellor Porter and Commissioner Ostrowski, for your time here. I'll be really quickly. I have two questions and one request. The first question is if there happens to be social workers, and I'm happy to hear about the 500, or school psychologists that decide to opt out of inoculating or getting vaccinated, what are the alternatives you're thinking about to provide the support services to students? Um, I wanted to know if DOHMH and H&H and &H, um, is requiring vaccinations of your personnel that work in schools or with CBOs. And the last thing was a request. While iPads are great, we love iPads, they're easy to utilize, mm -hmm. they're not easy for instruction. Mm -hmm. So there are students that were having a hard time when they initially received the iPads. They weren't, it wasn't conducive with instruction depending on the platform that teacher was utilizing. So is there any way that we could focus on Chromebooks? Having a conversation would do it to just focus on Chromebooks um, as an option. And that's it for me. Thank, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. And I'll tell you, you are the school whisperer. I, I've heard that from many school leaders um, and teachers about the difference between how you can leverage an iPad and a Chromebook instructionally, which is why we've made an investment, significant investment in Chromebooks as well, and also have worked with principals to help them decide what works best for their community. So we hear you and we've made that investment. Um, you know, our, I agree with you, I had a, as a principal, I had a full-time social worker in my building and it made a difference and we weren't in a post, we weren't in a pandemic. We weren't returning to school after not having not been in school for 18 months. It's our expectation that every staff member who works in a school building is vaccinated. And so we are in the process of working with the unions through what that means if a person chooses not to, but any person who works in our buildings will be vaccinated and work with our students. I'll, we also have worked in our ex Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk about our social work pool um, because we worked really hard to build up that pool so that we could recruit for our schools because we knew that this was going to be an important moment for our system. Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Sorry. Thank you, Chancellor. And thank you so much for that question. Um, we understand the um, mental health and wellness 
um, component of the work that we have to do to safely return our young people and our educators back to our, our school communities. And we recognize that our social workers and our guidance counselors, they're critical to making this work happen. Um, we also have the support of our community schools. Thank you so much to council. We're able to increase the number of community schools that we have, and they provide a plethora of supports in our school communities, including mental health and wellness support. We also have school-based mental health clinics on hand that will be readily available. For the first time this year, we're focused on um, more intense supports in classrooms, so really aligning the social-emotional learning and the academics under Chancellor Porter's leadership. That's the work that we're engaged in. We've trained over 75,000 educators on trauma-informed care, how to recognize trauma. We're partnering with parents. We have over 900 parent leaders who work with us over the summer and will be in schools as partners to other parents supporting mental health and wellness. So we have a robust plan in place, including curriculum resources. We also have NYC Well, which is a partner in the process with us, health and hospitals, DOH, and others that recognize the seriousness of this moment from a mental health and wellness um, lens as well. And we're here to provide full support in this area. Thank you, and if you could think about students that are gonna be receiving home instruction, it's great to have all these things in place, but what about the students that are at, at home? So we wanna consider alternatives for them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'm sorry, just Council Member Lewis, that's another reason why we're really looking at how we build this out, because we know we wanna make sure that our students who aren't in the building are still connected to a school and a community, a school community, and all of the resources that come with it. And next we'll turn to Councilmember Brandon. Thank you, Chairs. Um, thank you, Chancellor and Dr. Choksi for being here today. Um, I think it goes without saying uh, when it comes to our kids um, and those we entrust in their care, we have to do not just the best we can, but everything we can to make sure that they're safe. Um, and we're still in the middle of a global pandemic, so extreme caution and care really has to be our top priority. Um, and while I certainly appreciate that the mayor has been focused on getting everyone back to school and back in, in our classrooms, which we know there's no substitute for in classroom and in classroom education, it's just confusing to me when every day I hear of another school district um, far lesser than our great school system here in the city of New York. I think there's over 80 of the largest 100 school districts across the country are offering a remote option. Um, and it sounds like the DOE is, is preparing for this, but sort of holding this card for some reason. And I don't understand why. I think there's a lot of parents who would like to have that option. And I'm, I'm confused as to why we're not just putting that forward now. Why are we waiting for an inevitability where that may or may not be the case? So I think there are two things there. One, we're not holding a card. We have put out our um, medically fragile option for families who want to opt into a, an option other than coming in person in the building. I would also say this. We know that in the event of a closure, in the event of a quarantine, we have to be prepared to pivot to remote. Um, we are going to continue to build our system and work to be able to do that. And so we're not holding out, waiting for something to happen. We are focusing in on what we know is important and that is to get our babies back in in person. What we've heard from all of the experts and, and all of our, even our families and students, while we know that there's a sense of nervousness, we know what, what works best for students. We know what works best for children. You know, I have had to grapple with the same decisions that parents across New York City are making as I prepare to send my 11th grader back into a school building on public transportation. And so it, I, I understand the concern, but we're not holding back a thing. We are making sure that our system is ready to pivot should we need to pivot, and also making sure we have an option for our med medically fragile students. Okay, but I guess uh, that's understood, and I appreciate that. I guess what I'm hearing, though, is there's a contingency, but there's yeah. not, what, what other school districts are doing is giving an option up front. They're offering the option. What you're talking about is different. It's a contingency. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, wanna, I wanna keep moving. So as of today, 
how many of our schools in the city are at over 100% capacity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kevin? All of our principals were provided with capacity reports across the city of New York and, and looked at what they were historically and where they are today. Uh, if you need updated capacity reports, we usually publish it online. I'll make sure you get a copy. Okay, I'm asking because what I'm hearing from a lot of parents and, and teachers as well is how, does, how will social distancing work in let's say a high school building that's at 183% capacity? Yeah, we, we had a working group uh, put together, and I really appreciate this question. We divided our schools into different tiers and looked at what those capacity constraints were. We looked at solutions that focused on staffing, that looked at alternate spacing, that looked at alternate spaces within a building, that also looked at alternate programs. And we've even had schools that are going to come in a little earlier in the most crowded, where we basically half the enrollment throughout the course of the day. So say, for an example, I had 4,000 students, and it's considered overcrowded. We would never, in this model, have more than 2,500 kids in a building at any one given time. So really, like half that capacity. So, you know, it re does require some flexibility. It requires some some student and family engagement. It requires some really out of the box thinking. It requires union engagement, and you come out with a model that works for kids and families. Because, you know, when we look back, uh, we share this mutuality, uh, council member, about how we're getting through a pandemic. And there are some give and some takes. And so some kids are coming in at 7:15. Some kids are staying until 5:30. And so. But that's how we're doing it. There's multiple approaches. We spent many months over the summer waiting for the CDC guidance and the state's guidance, and we're going to toe the line. And so we're getting three feet wherever possible. Uh, and you could assume in a classroom the spatial orientation varies. We've removed furniture in some instances. So these are unique. I'll be out of the school tomorrow. I go to schools as much as I can. And we, we support schools. Sometimes it's moving furniture. Sometimes it's moving some things they've acquired over the last 15 to 20 years that have filled the classroom and, and we can gain st space back through storage. And so there's, there's a lot happening there, but if there are those in your district, uh, I do know that there are some overcrowded schools in your district we can talk about. Yeah, I guess so, but as of right now, let's, if I'm a parent and I, and I have a kid in an in a overcrowded high school, w let's say the one, the, this hypothetical 4,000 kids is overcrowded, do, do at this point right now on September 1st, do I know what my kid's schedule is gonna be if he's gotta be in, he or she has to be in a school that's gonna be at half capacity because of social distancing? Yeah, our school leaders and principals and superintendents are working with families in real time and making those adjustments. And so that's definitely something that happens and, and families will be communicated with, absolutely. Okay, um, I, I, I think my colleague, uh, Council, uh, Council Member Lewis asked, but I wanted to clarify, for 3K, pre-K, early learn teachers and staff at CBOs, are they, is there a vaccine requirement there? Because I, I've heard different things. Not yet. They're, at this time, we're focused on f staff members who work in all of our DOE buildings. So is this a state city thing then? It, it is a, you know, obviously, you know, we're not the decision makers. Um, it is, you know, every agency is being looked at differently as the mayor makes decisions about vaccines. So as of right now, 3K, pre-K, early learning teachers and staff or, who are working at CBO and working at CBOs, there's not a vaccine requirement? Today, there is not. Okay, that sounds insane. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, but let me just clarify. Yeah. They are in the vax or test area. Right. So, there's, yes. you, you have to show yes. uh, 48 yes. hours, whatever it is. Yes. Is there, now, is, D, is the city do, are we pushing to change that so it's streamlined, everything is the same across the board? Because why would we make, why would it be different for pre-K, 3K and not? Well, we're, we're focused on what's happening in our school buildings and working with our partner agencies to make decisions about what happens next. Okay, but the, all these people are in our care, right? What, no matter what mm -hmm. building they're in. Um, last thing, I'm hearing from a lot of folks, uh, families of D75 students um, who are very concerned yep. with, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a, a student with an IEP, the past 18 months have been yes a quadruple nightmare. Um, what is being done to ensure uh, that those services, the mandated services are provided for those kids? Yep, so you know, you're absolutely right about what it's been like for students who are, are most vulnerable and we are going to continue to center and prioritize them. I'm gonna ask our Deputy Chief Academic Officer, Christina Fodi, to talk specifically about mandates, um, and supports that we're putting in place for our DC, D75 students, but all of our students with IEPs. Thank you. Here you go. Perfect.
Thank you, Council Member Brannon, and for your continued advocacy for our students with IEPs. Um, you know, we are very excited to be offering recovery services to every one of our students with IEPs. So we're not leaving to this to chance. Every student with an IEP is eligible for recovery services this year, which means that we are sending allocations to schools that will allow them to provide after school uh, and or Saturday programs where small group instruction will be delivered to our students with IEPs as well as additional related services, recognizing that the need is great and we have to make up, um, in some instances, make up related services, uh, but in all instances, make sure that students receive not only what is outlined on their IEPs during the school day, but that additional services are provided um, to every child with an IEP. Thank you. Thank Your you. office has been fantastic. I, I, you know, obviously, I always worry about the folks who suffer in silence, the folks that don't know to come to their local council member for advocacy. Those are the folks I really try to think about. Um, I, I'll just end with, I mean, it still just seems crazy to me that if at some point we're going to offer a remote option, I don't know why we wouldn't just join the other 80-something school districts across the country that are offering a remote option, uh, not as a contingency, just offering it right up front if there are families that want that. Um, I feel like it's going to happen anyway. I don't see why we wouldn't, we wouldn't offer it now. But that's all I've got. Thank you, Chair. Uh, sure, Councilman Brennan. I just want to make sure I, I clarify something I heard uh, Mr. Moran. When Councilman Brennan asked about the physical distancing in schools, um, I have <laughs> reviewed over and over again the language with regards to physical distancing, both from CDC, state, local. Um, and Dr. Toxie, feel free to weigh in here as well. Uh, there is language I, I know that talks about where feasible, where possible, and it also talks about that it should not prohibit kids from entering the building. However, the language shifts to be, to be more stronger from where feasible to must or shall when it comes to lunch. Can anyone speak to the physical, is, is there a requirement for schools to have physical distancing when kids are eating during lunch? Can anyone speak to this? Yeah, thank you for the question. The current guidance, you're right. It says three feet where possible. And we're coming up, we've had our directors of school but, food. But Kevin, does that apply to lunch That's as well? That's correct. That's correct. So when kids, when the masks are off and the kids are eating, they, it's, it's not required That's to have right. three well, we, yeah, what we recommend is that we use outdoor spaces, alternate spaces within, within the building, larger public assembly spaces to really get at it. We go school to school with principals, and we look at what's in that cafeteria, what's that spatial orientation, what's the size of the furniture, how much furniture, and ultimately, we measure the cubic feet per minute and the air exchanges per hour. We recently did a, a review of a high school uh, last week, a large high school, where we rely solely on outside air and some exhausters in the space. And we were turning 15 air exchanges per hour without our air purifiers. And we'd recently brought in air purifiers that'll up air exchanges to two to four air exchanges on top of the 15. Um, and as early as this morning, I was at a large high school and we were seeing nearly 20 air exchanges per hour in the cafeteria. And that also was being done without the air purifiers on. So we are putting a multi-layered approach when students are demasked and are eating and the duration of that time being limited and rotating uh, you know, where we can in alternate spaces. So we are working with principals on site-specific solutions, but it is three feet uh, where possible, and we're doing everything we can to make sure because we comply. Because what, what I'm reading here from NYSED, CDC, and, and they refer to CDC, CDC states that permitting large groups of students to eat in the cafeteria should be, should be based on community transmission rates. The commissioner testified that we have high transmission across the five boroughs. It says here, it goes on, schools should maximize physical distance as much as possible when students are moving through the food service line and while eating, especially indoors. Using additional spaces and outdoor seating can facilitate distancing. Schools should consider limiting meals to classrooms in areas with substantial, so this is the key sentence here also, schools should consider limiting meals to classrooms in areas with substantial or high transmission rates. Um, will kids be eating lunch 
in their classrooms. That, that will happen. Uh, I was remiss in not thanking our school cafeteria workers and those that served over 110 million meals over the last year. Amen to that. I agree 100% yeah. on that. They, they literally met students where they were, and that was inclusive of bringing the lunches from the cafe to the classroom. And so uh, I really appreciate them and all that they do. Um, and so that's something where we talk to the principal, the school food manager, and the school staff there, and what's possible. So the idea is to where possible means where possible. And we get out there and we go, we serve in classrooms, we serve potentially in, in other places that are public assembly, we do serve and meet outside. Um, and in high schools, you know, grab and go is a popular but, option too. But Dr. Choksi, you understand, and, and it's the last point here, I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues. You understand there's the, the contradiction or the conflicting message to the public is that there seems to be stricter rules in terms of indoor dining or at, at a bar restaurant than it comes to eating lunch uh, in, in a school community. Can, can, you, can you speak to that? Uh, well, look, there is a very clear recommendation um, with respect to how to keep kids safe um, during meal times. Uh, the vaccine requirement that applies for all staff is one of those layers of precautions. Uh, but as my colleague has pointed out, um, the language is we should maximize physical distancing where possible. And this is important during mealtimes because it is, uh, it is a, a time when um, children will go without masks for some period. But there are ways to mitigate that. And that's why we keep referring back to the layers of prevention. When you don't have a mask on, that does mean that ventilation, uh, as Mr. Moran just described, as well as distancing become more important. But very importantly, in the New York State education guidance, as well as the recent commissioner's determination from the New York State Department of Health, all of that language mirrors what is in the CDC guidance, which says, Yes, maximize physical distancing in the ways that the Department of Education is doing, but this should not preclude in-person learning. So we have to hold these, these goals but in our hands together. Commissioner, would you agree, as, as a medical professional, CDC guidance has, has evolved and changed, and sometimes historically has not always changed uh, for all the right reasons. Uh, and, and also the city is very, I mean, I, I, I follow this closely, the city is very selective where it says we're meeting CDC guidance in these areas, but then it says in other areas we're exceeding CDC guidance. Uh, so I, I get this, but I'm just saying that the, the public is hearing, parents are hearing, kids are hearing, that when you go to a bar or restaurant, there are, you have to have this mandatory, there's vaccination critical rules. In, in school, for young kids, there is still no vaccine. We don't have data yet about the number of kids in the school system who are, who are vaccinated. Quite frankly, we still don't even have data on the entire school communities because principals have also raised that as far as their staff. I know that there's a requirement, but there's no language about what happens if, if they don't get, because uh, I think that's, that's being negotiated, I think, with, with labor. So I'm just pointing out that this concern remains uh, very prevalent. Uh, but I, in the interest of time, I'll turn it back to, to Malcolm to call the next council member. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Gredenchik, followed by Council Members Dinowitz, Amprey Samuel, Borelli, Lander, Riley, Gennaro, Miller, Brooks Powers, Felice, Kalos, and Levin. Uh, council Member Gredenchik. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Chair Traeger, Chair Levine. I want to thank the Chancellor and uh, Commissioner and, and everybody who's here today. Um, we've heard a lot, and um, this is truly a titanic undertaking, running the New York City public school system, uh, especially during a pandemic. And a lot of my questions have been asked, but one question that hasn't been asked yet is pupil transportation. And I know that we're requiring people that are, thank you. I know that we're requiring people that are working in schools to be vaccinated by a certain date. Are we requiring bus uh, drivers and attendants to be vaccinated as well, Chancellor? I'll, I'll let uh, Kevin Moran speak to our work with our bus companies. Yeah, Executive Order 74 does not uh, contemplate uh, staff outside of uh, the school building, but uh, the safe uh, COVID requirement does require that they're tested um, weekly or get the vaccine. Um, I will be honest with you, we sent this out very early last winter uh, to our drivers when, when we were given priority status for teachers, school bus drivers and staff were included in that. We did see a big uptake there. 
We're working with them now. We have uh, vaccine sites open at 65 Court Street currently, and has been for a while. And we also process at 44, 36 Vernon Boulevard as well. So we're encouraging our, our, our staff uh, that are contracted, that work outside of our buildings, obviously to, find, to follow the guidance, but encouraging vaccines as well. It's very concerning to me because many, I have many District 75 schools in my district. Uh, most of those children are transported to school by uh, the yellow buses. And yeah. uh, in many cases, they're, they're very fragile. Uh, their, their needs are, uh, are much greater than, um, than the average student. And I am concerned because essentially they're in a sealed, almost sealed metal tube uh, in some cases, I had a child that attends school on Marathon Parkway in, in Eastern Queens uh, coming from Staten Island. Uh, this was pre-pandemic. I don't know if that's every single day. I don't know if that's still true. Um, I, I would hope that we would move uh, as expeditiously as possible to get all those people vaccinated. The other concern I have is that these buses are used five days a week. What are we doing to ensure that the buses, the vans, all those um, uh, vehicles are being cleaned every day? Um, because, you know, kids, even adults, tend to be messy at times. And um, we need to ensure, to the best of our ability, uh, that these, these buses are as clean as possible. So I'd like to hear what um, somebody has to say about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I appreciate the question and commentary. I would add that our school staff, uh, very fortunately, we're going to be positioned with these 700 plus buildings in the Vax to School campaign to make sure that those drivers and attendants unvaccinated to date have opportunities to go there as well. So we're going to ensure that on that front. Secondly, on, on cleaning and anything related to the bus uh, industry currently, we're following the CDC and state guidance as well. And so you'll see bus, buses with the windows down, the roof hatches open, the air non-circulating, mandatory mask wearing. And then what you won't see is what I have inspectors for as the follow-up is the nightly dis deep cleaning and disinfecting. We were providing, or very early in the pandemic, uh, bus companies with the electrostatic sprayers and that technology, along with the disinfectant, along with hand wipes, along with uh, hand sanitizer. And for special education, we provided enhanced PPE. And to Councilmember Levine's point earlier, the KN95 was a very popular product, uh, assuming, like Dr. Chachi said, students can tolerate it. But we also, for staff, provided face shields, the additional K95, surgical masks, uh, gloves, et cetera, to make sure the staff that have extended routes long period of time uh, were, were covered and safe. I will tell you, uh, we follow, like everyone, all cases coming into the sit room. And we've had, had cases where students were present and did have enough viral load, uh, were on the, uh, the bus and had the virus, but anyone on the, sta on the bus did not because of the universal mask wearing, because of the enhanced PPE approaches, the ventilation in the bus is being open. So we do actively monitor that, and we do actively fi follow the CDC guidance and the state guidance, and it's all posted on a website for families to see as well. But I give you the assurance that we have the enhanced PPE, and we do the nightly cleaning and disinfecting, and we definitely check with companies to make sure their staff are getting vaccinated. And the last question, uh, Mr. Chair, um, you know, sometimes these bus rides can be quite lengthy. Um, the Staten Island to Marathon Parkway route, obviously, um, I don't know who drew that up, but um, have we done anything, and I don't know if we have the ability um, to do anything to shorten these bus rides or to, you know, get more students in closer proximity or an extra bus ride here or there? Yeah, to the extent possible, we, we encourage uh, the closest school to one's residence, but understanding there are schools that are outside of five miles and, and require a bit of longer run. Uh, we look at that actively, and if there are one-offs, uh, our routing team right now is, is they, they're making route adjustments. I have families texting me as we, as we talk here today. And so, you know, their information's in Nixa and they know where the school is, they know uh, the information. So there's definitely time and space to review a route. Uh, certainly if there's IEP mandated time limits, we wanna obviously observe that and get it as short as possible, so yes. And there's more to come on that in terms of our overall modernization, OPT, and the use of technology and routing. So that's coming, more to come. I thank you. There's a lot that goes into educating our children every day. And, you know, the New York City school bus system is, would be one of the largest public transportation networks in the country um, if it stood by itself. I thank you for your answers, and I thank Chair Traeger for indulging me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. Next we'll hear from Councilmember Dinowitz.
Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Chair Traeger, um, not just for the, for the hearing. As you know, a year ago, at this time, I was a public school teacher in New York City. Um, and one of the big problems we faced then, we are facing it now, is what so many families and professionals feel is a lack of communication, of honest communication about what is happening. And during that time, I and so many of my colleagues and families felt comfort um, with the information that you provided. Where the DOE failed, you were able to provide that information, um, a sense of comfort and, and knowledge about what was going on in our school. So, so I, I, on behalf of myself and my colleagues and families, I, I, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for last year and for what's happening uh, now. Um, I, Doctor, you spoke about air exchange, and I want to just clarify a few points because um, it, it's so important we get this right. Um, you know, a chance that you and I both know and believe the social, emotional, and mental health of our children is paramount, but part of that means knowing that our children are safe when they enter the building, our professionals are safe when they enter the building. Um, so I want to talk first about the, the filters. And to clarify something, on the DOE website, it says every classroom will have two filters. Uh, in your opening remarks, you said every room will have two filters. So I just want to clarify which rooms will have these filters. Does it include guidance suites? Does it include yeah. not t atypical classrooms like a shop yeah. class, a music class? Um, and, and any other sort of a classroom which may not fit neatly under the classroom category. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Denowitz, for that question. And you're right. It's important that we're clear about what we mean um, when we, we're talking about one, I'm going to ask Kevin to talk specifically about what rooms, um, what will be covered in those rooms, and what we're talking about when we're discussing air exchanges. Because like we said, you know, our custodial engineers, our facilities teams have done an amazing job to make sure that the air in our building are, is, you know, beyond the standards of expectations. Yeah, thanks for the question and, and, and the opportunity to clarify. Um, we will have two uh, purifiers in every single classroom that meet or exceed uh, a HEPARD standard. So that is concretely, you'll see that in every classroom. You should, with the expectation, know that we'll put air purifiers where there are congregate staff or students. And that could be in the library, uh, that could be in the cafeteria. The cafeteria, we're really excited about uh, the latest ones we procured to cover up to 3,000 square feet. As it, just more broadly on air purifiers, they are solely meant to supplement the underlying system within the school building. And so while we're, we're very, very pleased with the high efficiency, and, and what happened last year in an environment in 1,400 buildings with less than 1% infection and spread in schools, we're really encouraged that the, the approaches, multiple layer approaches, as the doctor said, were really effective in keeping kids, students and staff safe. So that was with one air purifier in the classroom. We added the second, anticipating, and, and you know, not opposed to adding additional as needed. And so we walk, our facility staff walks with school principals. They have instruments to, to gauge ventilation, one being an anemometer, which can assess airflow on the moment and tell and do a calculation. It's width by length, by by a height of room and it gives you, after the CFM reading, it gives you an output and it tells you how many air exchanges. And also a CO2 reader, which is fundamentally how much air is being exchanged. You could even do it in this chamber. And you could do it in your car, you could do it on a train. And how much air, CO2, is still being recirculated. And so those are the concerns for us around ventilation. We want to make sure we're introducing fresh air and we're exhausting fresh air to make sure there's not a viral load should a symptomatic or asymptomatic individual be present in those spaces. So we're confident that the approaches we've taken have been I, effective. I can tell you're excited about these air purifiers. Yeah. Uh, a sentence I never thought I'd say. Thanks for the question. Um, but but just, to, just to clarify, and you've, and you've heard from a number of members today, deeper concerns about our children with special needs. And so when you say classroom, does that include, again, to, to be a, as clear as possible, the guidance suite is not just a congregate set for, for, for adults, it's where our children with emotional needs go when they need help. The conference room is not just a place for adults, it's where we hold our IEP meetings, right? The, the, the spaces for the resource rooms may not be considered a traditional classroom. Will these spaces have these air, fill, these air purifiers? 
Yes, uh, we'll add them if, if there's a place where they're not now currently. Every school I've walked, they've been there in offices and certainly the main office and you know, assistant principals and conference room. So yes, we, we've ordered additional uh, purifiers. We will have some centrally and in our borough offices as any school requests. Uh, it's very well known. Uh, the chancellor has made it very clear. Schools will be well resourced and make sure they get what they need. Principals will have it. And so I'll follow up on any guidance suites that may not be covered currently. Thank you. And um, the, the schools currently have these purifiers, right? They are in the buildings now? They're in our buildings now. And it was wonderful to take a walk through the school building with you, Council Member Dinowitz. Um, but they're in our school buildings now. They're also at our borough central offices. Should schools need additional um, purifiers in their buildings? And do you have a, seems silly, but you have extent, you're providing extension cords or power, power outlets. I mean, it seems yeah, silly, no, but it, having it taught is, in a classroom with one is, outlet, it's- It is your teacher moment. And yes, yeah. we're, we, we do not want schools to have to need a thing to keep our environment safe, to keep our air purifiers working. And so if they need extension cords, if they need surge protectors, we're happy to provide them. Um, but that, that has not been an issue, I can tell you that. Good. And I do value that you have been in the classroom. So a lot of the questions yes. that many, you know, bureaucrats may not think to think of, I value that you think of them because you've, you've been in the classroom. And that's very, very important for someone in your position. Um, it also says on the website that bigger cafeterias will have these filters. But it sounds like you're saying every cafeteria will have these filters. Can you clarify if they all will? And if not, what is a bigger cafeteria? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And uh, I also was a classroom teacher, so I just want to clarify. I, I didn't uh, mean to leave you out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Everyone's included. Anyone's a teacher, good job. <laughs> yeah, so um, I do share the cafeteria experience. And all of our cafeterias will be covered uh, with these air purifiers. We are prioritizing any of the larger spaces where we've spoken with principals and we've talked a little bit about capacity, numbers of periods being used, and those extra layer of protect protection. We've also added exhaust fans, which actually help with the airflow on the upper sash of our windows in large cafeterias. Uh, it's pretty impressive the air exchange rates we're getting that exceed 20. Um, and so we anticipate the capacity and we anticipate as well making sure we ramp up the ventilation in those spaces. Again, you're very excited about that air exchange. Yeah. Um, and these filters, I assume, need to be maintained, yeah. cleaned. Um, you know, there's been a lot of reports about these are HEPA standards, but they're not HEPA filters. So can you, can you A, talk about are these HEPA filters and who is maintaining them and how often they will be cleaned or maintained? Yeah, the, the nomenclature on is it a HEPA filter per se or does it meet the HEPA standard? it exceed, meet and exceeds the, the standard. And so it gets down to the 0.3 uh, micron of, to take out any infectious aerosols. And so in, in, when you put it in the unit, it's been tested against other units who have HEPA filters and theirs have definitely reduced effectiveness. The units we've selected are efficient, they're effective, they're cost, they're a lot, they're cost you know, uh, within our reach. And actually we could procure uh, nearly 150,000 of those units and so with that, to your point, came the uh, filter replacement schedule. These have two filters. There's an internal, there's a pre-filter, and there's a secondary filter. And so we're very impressed with this technology and actually very impressed with the, the outcomes we saw last school year. And so, yes, there's a schedule for them to be maintained, and the custodian works to make sure that those are replaced uh, in due time. Okay, so, the, so the custodian is in charge, and the custodian is on top of it. But, you know, as is the, well, I'll skip that in, in the, uh, for time, um, what is a 30-day supply of masks? Yeah, yeah I a have PPE? a yeah. For, for 30 day, it's based upon student enrollment, and so the burn rate's been assessed all last year, and it's just a multiplier effect. And so, how many kids do you have? How many do you expect back? With the assumption every kid and every staff in them needs a mask every day, I literally have over a million surgical masks at 4436 Vernon Boulevard on pallets. We have an amazing team that showed up, our facilities team, shipping and receiving on our team and led by John Shea. Their team has been just uh, dynamic every day showing up and making sure we're sourced. What happened this year over last in terms of the surge of procurement, uh, we were very lucky uh, to be supported by DCAS in, in, the, in the, the ability to, to work the supply chain. 
Um, we since transitioned this to custodians to get exactly what that school needs in that t time and space. So the principal and, and the chancellor will, will know that the principal is the first conversation, last conversation with the custodian, right? And so making sure custodians knew exactly what they needed, talking about the burn rate, uh, and making sure they have everything they need. And, and, and at a moment's notice, we could send nights or weekends from our boroughs places if there's a shortage. Uh, but right now, we're ready to go and 30-day uh, supply of all PPE. So, I mean, respectfully, million sounds like a lot, but that's like, you know, a day. That's just my, that's like my junk drawer. That's the clock. Every school has their 30 I hope they're supply. not junk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope they're not junk, man. No. Um, but, but you see, you see the, the concern, and, and again, this gets to what I mentioned earlier with Chair Traeger. He was sharing pictures of my friends, my colleagues, our teachers, our children's teachers, pictures on Twitter. This is my PPE for the weekend. It was, it was a couple masks and a couple gloves for the entire week. They didn't get any the next week. And I, 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 you know, I want to make sure that if any child or adult needs a mask, that, it's a, that, it, that it is there, it's available. And again, a, a million sounds like a lot, but it's you know, yeah. not. Our stock and supply is maintained at the school building level. So each school, all 1,400 buildings are fully stocked. I have a million just in case if there's any issues. And then there's out in the boroughs too. Uh, the council member knows if he could send me escalations, if you see escalations, we're happy to talk to the, to the district leadership uh, and the principal, make sure they have what they need if there's any supply interruption. So a, a, a theme I'm hearing, and I, I wanna make sure I'm getting this right, is that if a school reaches out to you, you, you give them what they need? Yes, and okay. I will say we're in contact with the custodians, the facilities teams, the principals are in communication with those people. Um, they know where to get the resources when needed. And, and to your point of the last year, we don't want any teacher, we don't want any principal, we don't want any family, any student to be deterred while, by what we consider a minor expense for us, and that is to supply and ensure that every school has a 30-day supply of PPE every single day. We don't want that to get in the way, and so we have PPE in abundance, and our principals and our, our Custodians, to Chair Traeger's point about another thing on principals, principals don't have to worry about this. They just have to say to their custodian, we need it, and they got it. Good. I, I don't want uh, children to be deterred or families to be Absolutely. deterred either, but I, I, just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, one's about attendance. Yes. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to encourage students to stay home or encourage families to keep their children home when they're not feeling well. Mm -hmm. That is the safest and smartest thing to do. But with that, are you still judging schools and children mm -hmm. based on their attendance? Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm asking this is because you have two different incentives. The more important incentive is to keep us all safe and alive. Mm -hmm. But the one that follows you to college and the one that the school receives on their quality review <laughs> on the website, when the, when the chancellor or the executive superintendent comes into a school and looks at that bulletin board, they see attendance data. So you have conflicting incentives, and I'm wondering if you've addressed that with schools and with families. I, you know, we're, we're in a different place than we were two years ago. We had to address that last year, how we uh, managed. Yeah, I'm, 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 I just, yep. You had what? We're in a different place than we were two years ago. When, to your point, right, like the, we will, that 90% attendance, this is the priority. We recognize that the most important thing that we need to do in this moment is keep our, keep our families and our communities safe. And so we want, if our parent, if our children feel sick, that they stay at home. To your point, that is the best measure. However, we also want them to be in school. We will not be penalizing students. We will not be penalizing schools. Um, I'm gonna ask Deputy Chancellor Sean Robinson to talk about the attendance policies and procedures and the way we code attendance differently in this moment so we can account for an absence that's connected to a COVID-related potential illness. Thank you so much, Chancellor, and thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, we are leading with support this year in all areas. As the Chancellor said, the most important responsibility that we have is the health and safety of our children and school communities, and policy is aligned with that. So when young people have to stay home due to the health screener that you know students and families and all members of a school community are expected to do every morning, 
That information will be updated in our iLog system. We'll make a notation and we'll support that young person academically to ensure that if they can, they can stay on track. And if not, when they return, we'll make sure that they have the supports that they need. So the, the lead for us is health and safety, policy follows, and we'll make a notation in our iLog system and provide that young person with the support that they need to be so, successful. I don't mean to interrupt, I just wanna you know, respect everyone's time. Who, who is we? In other words, when a student is home, is it up to that student's teacher to additionally provide remote instruction or is there some sort of, um, I don't wanna say central, <laughs> central support, but who is providing support to that child who is encouraged to stay home? Our school communities have done tremendous work over the last 18 months, over the summer, and we know that they will as we transition into this new school year. So all of us, we're all on the same page. When I say we, I mean the collective we, the New York City Department of Education, but certainly at the school level with the principal, the teacher in the classroom, making sure that the young person receives what he or she may need to be successful. So, so all of our systems are aligned toward that effort. We are one team working collaboratively. We have supports through superintendents at the BCO level with our executive superintendents, all of us collectively. We recognize the magnitude in, of this moment and we recognize that we're leading with health and safety and healing while also making sure that our young people can receive the academic support that they need at this time as well. So do, does that include additional staff for an individual? I mean, I'm very concerned about what it means for a school. You've heard, again, the chair say a lot of principals are over burdened, um, and the, I can tell you teachers are, <laughs> I was too, are there additional staff provided for that support? And, and I'll ask uh, Deputy Chief Academic Officer Linda Chen to come join me. So we know, like Deputy Chancellor Robinson said, um, we have to lead with support. And we also know that, you know, they're going to be prop some more days out than typical because we're asking families to keep their children home when they are sick. Um, and so, but we also know, and you and I know teacher to teacher, that we are going to make sure that our students have what they need so that they can either get back on track or remain on track during that time that they're off. We have resources both centrally and locally to do that. We have tons of lessons that are available online that we can provide to students. Um, teachers will prepare individualized you know, learning packages for students while they're out. And so we know that all of those things are happen, but to Deputy Chancellor Robinson's point, we need to make sure that we're also supporting schools and supporting teachers by providing access to resources so teachers don't have to create things for students to do while they are doing the thing we need them to do, and that is help keep our community safe. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Councilman, for the question and the concern about our students and their learning when they are not able to come to school. Mm -hmm. First of all, as the Chancellor mentioned earlier, we do have a plan in the event of quarantine for our students. In addition, I wanted to speak specifically about the resources that she referenced. We know that our schools are also hiring as many staff as possible. Um, and with that, we are centrally providing resources as we have in the last year. For instance, we have in Teach Hub um, lessons every day, K through 12, for all subject areas where teachers or substitute teachers can access lessons. In addition, with the partnership with the UFT, we also have teachers who last year who were very developed in their craft of online teaching who re have recorded lessons that accompany a number of those lessons that are available as well. As the Chancellor said, we want to make sure that not only when it comes to PPE and health and safety factors, but also academically, that our teachers have the resources they need to serve the students wherever they are. Thank you. I, I'll just ask two more, because I know I'm probably going over time, but um, back to, to, to Councilmember Gredentia's question about the, the busing. Mm -hmm. um, for, for younger children, and this especially impacts our younger children and children with special needs, of course. Um, a class is quarantined if there are a certain number of cases that your website says um, uh, elementary school, a positive case in a classroom, all students 
quarantine. Does that apply to if a child takes a bus? What's the process if a child yes. takes a bus and, as he said, is in a, a long metal tube and is positive? What's the quarantine situation there? Yeah, excellent question. Um, as with last year, the school bus is an extension of the school and is treated as a classroom. And so those close contacts that quarantine, we contact through the night. We do what we need to do to make sure that students and staff are protected. Okay. And thank you. And, and my last question is, your uh, disease detectives, uh, good, good name. How long does an investigation take? And is there a mechanism if it takes a certain number of hours or days for automatically closing a school just in case? I imagine it's a, well, go ahead. Certainly, um, yes, our, our disease detectives have been working around the mm -hmm. clock, uh, not just with respect to supporting schools, uh, but all of the environments in New York yes. City. I'm, I'm so grateful to them for their expertise uh, and for their diligence, which, um, which has saved lives over the last 18 months. With respect to your question, uh, usually an investigation uh, takes um, you know, at least a day and can take uh, days. Um, we certainly try to do this as expeditiously as possible because of what's on the line with respect to making a determination um, and to the chair's question from earlier, ensuring that communication happens as quickly as it can. Uh, it does take time to do these rigorously, uh, and you know, because it is a momentous decision, of course, if um, there is an indication that there's widespread transmission and a school needs to be closed, so that has to be done in an epidemiologically sound way. Uh, so that's the general time frame. Um, it varies quite a bit from specific circumstance to circumstance, depending on the size of the school, the number of cases, um, you know, whether it was multiple spaces or cohorts affected or not. And those are all things that we deploy a team to collect information on as quickly as we possibly can. So it, it just, you know, this, these were issues we saw last year, the feeling any, any teacher or parent will know this feeling of hurry up and wait. And I, and I, appreciate the immense amount of work that's done by these detectives, mm -hmm. but if it takes longer than a day, imagine being a parent or a teacher knowing there are multiple cases in your school where you work, where you send your child, and knowing that that disease could be spreading and spreading while these detectives conduct their investigation. So you're saying there's no mechanism to automatically close a school just in case that, that, that doesn't exist. Well, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, I should say, if there is a case, then close contacts and, you know, if it involves a, a classroom, for example, at the elementary school level, those can happen very quickly. Uh, as soon as the case is confirmed, um, it's transmitted to the situation room, uh, and that, you know, that feedback loop occurs uh, quickly and um, certainly more quickly in recent months given the experience and the iteration you know, that we've been able to bring to our protocols through the situation room. It's when we're talking about that more detailed level of investigation, where again, there's a determination about whether or not there is widespread transmission in a school, that it does take some extra time beyond that. So I wanna assuage at least part of the concern, which is you know, for exposures that have happened, uh, it may be the case that a classroom is already quarantining and then the further determination is whether that needs to extend to the full school or not. Okay, I, I, I don't think it quite, respectfully, don't think it quite answers the, the question, but I, I will. Well, know. just to clarify, Commissioner, because if a, if a member of the school staff who, let's say, is vaccinated finds out that they tested positive for the virus because I think you, you have agree that there have been breakthrough cases. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Is that member of the school staff required to tell the principal that they have tested positive? Does anyone know that? Yes, they are. Okay. And is, if let's say that information does not trickle up to the administrator, does the situation room get an alert that a member of the school staff tested positive somewhere and does that trickle up to the school because last school year, Folks, what led to a number of closures was not just about kids testing positive, it was staff, because that also counts into the count last year. Uh, 
does, if someone does not notify the principal that they tested positive, does that information still trickle up the situation room, or it's, can anyone speak to that? Uh, well, what I can say is that there are multiple modes of communication to get that information about positive cases. With respect to the specifics of this, I, I may have to defer to my colleagues. So, yeah. mm -hmm. All students and staff are encouraged to, to inform the principal of a COVID diagnosis. You said encouraged. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, the, the fact, I think you're tugging at a very um, potentially innocent question. But if somebody gets COVID and, and has a diagnosis and refuses to notify the administration, I, I think that's a whole different topic altogether. I, I don't know how to answer that one. Yeah. And I would just add, we're, we are still engaging in our health screening protocol. And through the health screening protocol, um, a staff member would have to identify and that would warrant them to not be in the building. And so I think it's important to note that that's still a part of our layered approach to health and safety in our buildings. Okay. Uh, thanks for the additional information. Yes. Uh, and I, you know, I just want to thank all of you. I, I know you're all working very hard. I look forward to working with all of you to make sure our kids, our families, our professionals are safe. And I encourage you to please, you know, again, a huge issue that I'm consistently seeing and I saw throughout this, these 18 months is communication, mm -hmm. honest communication. And I think that that goes a long way um, in, in, in allaying any fears that, that people may have and do have about returning to school. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Amphrey Samuel, followed by Council Members Borelli, Riley, Gennaro, and Miller. Uh, Council Member Amphrey Samuel. Good afternoon, everyone. I just have a few quick um, follow up questions, just for point of clarification. In reference to the school buses, um, do you ensure that the buses are practicing healthy spacing and just, you know, three feet, six feet between the children on the buses? So I'll let uh, Kevin Moran talk about our busing protocols. Okay, next. Um, the nurses that are in the schools, are they all, the new nurses, are they all DOE nurses or are some of them from agencies or different things? Okay, we'll start with the busing and then go to nurses. As it relates to school busing, uh, we are following CDC guidance and having three feet uh, on buses where possible. And there will be instances where that's not possible. And when it's not possible? We're using, so when I started off earlier on the, the school buses, we are using and have the access to and have provided to the companies enhanced PPE, uh, deep cleaning, disinfection uh, opportunities. And so everyone's required to wear a mask. Buses will leave the roof hatches open for ventilation, will leave the windows open, and will leave the system on not recirculating so that the air is not recirculated in the cabin. So for the duration of the ride, they're required to wear a mask. For those that want enhanced PPE, we can provide that, and that's inclusive of face shields, KN5 masks, surgical gloves, uh, hand sanitizer, and, and wipes. And so those are available. Uh, to the extent possible, we want everyone social distancing on busing. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Council Member, for that question regarding nurses. Um, within our school system, we have Department of Education nurses, um, DOH, Department of Health nurses. We also have a partnership with H and H Health and Hospitals, who provide nurses for us, along with agency nurses. In each school, we will have a high, highly qualified, trained nurse and DOE systems within our school buildings, just like last year. Okay, and my last question um, is just going back to the vaccinations. So what are the current consequences or penalties for non-compliance? And this is in, in specifically talking about the teachers and DOE staff in the school. And also, is the administration prepared to fill positions left vacant as a result of the mandate in the quote unquote non-compliance? Thank you for that really important question. And, and it's our expectation that all of our faculty members will comply. Um, the city is currently in impact bargaining to discuss with the unions the consequences of, of faculty members who don't comply. Um, we have, you know, as a result of the pandemic, amassed an extensive sub pool that we expect can support our schools. But you know, our hope is that our teachers, our faculty members will do what they've continued to do throughout this pandemic and that show up for our students by getting vaccinated and creating a level of safety and protection around them. 
and for those that don't. For those that I know you said that you're in the middle yep, of a yep, bargaining, but in the event this like you yep. know takes it to court and is extended out and it's a, a a long process, what are you doing in the interim? In the interim, we are currently in impact bargaining and expect that our mandate will require that the vaccination that one dose be completed by September 27th. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Borelli. Uh, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Troxy, were you involved in forming the city's key to the city policy? Yes, I was. I'd like to read something into the record uh, from a document that the city's providing businesses and to the public on the key to the uh, city issued August 17th, uh, entitled Guidance for Customers and Employee on Equitable Implementation of the Key to the City. Page 1, Section 3 reads, as an employee, you have the right to a reasonable accommodation to enable you to perform your job if you are unable to show proof of vaccination because of a disability, pregnancy, religious belief, or your status as a victim of domestic violence, stalking, or sex offenses. It goes on, page three. If you're seeking a reasonable accommodation because of a medical condition or due to a pregnancy, your employer can request a note from a medical provider supporting your inability to show proof of vaccination. So the question is, uh, is this is a document from the administration. So is the administration right when they say employers must provide reasonable accommodation for disability, pregnancy, religious belief, or your status as a victim of domestic violence, stalking, or sex offenses? Or are they right when, as the chancellor indicate, employees won't be given exemptions and they're to be terminated or whatever the consequences? Um, well, yeah. what I would say, uh, council member, is that the key to NYC and the vaccine requirement for uh, Department of Education staff um, are uh, two different programs. Yes. Uh, they do have um, different specifications, uh, but both of them do have a common goal, which is uh, the health, safety, and protection of New Yorkers. And we can, we can speak to your question. Um, Lauren Siciliano can speak to that question. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Just specifically in terms of, of DOE, um, I think the, the language that you saw in that document refers to a range of federal, state, and local laws around reasonable accommodations. And we are, as the Chancellor said, working closely with our union partners and our city health partners to, um, to understand the parameters for those types of accommodations. But that language references uh, general legal requirements around. Uh, so, just, just to clarify, did you say you're considering what accommodations that are being made? We are, as part of the impact bargaining that the Chancellor described, uh, we're working with our labor partners and city health partners to understand the parameters for those. Okay, so just for the record, the DOE is considering exemptions to make for certain employees for reasons listed in the city's other documents that I read. Those refer to uh, local, state, and federal laws that DOE is also required to follow. Why, so the governor, the last governor, um, indicated that schools were much safer than so many other different environments. Um, and I think, Chancellor, you, you said that as well. And I agree with you. So why was it safe to provide those exemptions to establishments that are under the licenses of New York City and not for the DOE? I mean, that, that, that's my question. But if you're saying you're considering that, I mean, I, I guess why wasn't that made clear? So, um the, um, I don't have the specific language that you're looking at, but what it sounds like is that it's referring to a general suite of laws that uh, employers like DOE are also required to follow in terms of instances in which reasonable accommodations need so to be So do we, do we know yet what will happen to a teacher who is not vaccinated on September 28th? No. Um, so just to, just to give like a real world hypothetical, a, a teacher who's pregnant um, with a note from her doctor claiming, you know, it's not in her medical interest. Fr frankly, I don't think it's your information. You, you're, you need to know the information of why the doctor thinks that. But the doctor's saying it's not in this particular person's interest to have the vaccine. That person will be fired um, by the DOE, potentially. If, so if again, I may start on yeah, the medical part yep. of it, mm -hmm. Chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, first, I just want to make clear, Council Member, that um, we have a strong recommendation that, uh, that people who are pregnant um, do get vaccinated. In fact, the CDC recently strengthened its recommendation about uh, the benefits far outweighing the risks for vaccination for people who are uh, pregnant 
uh, people who but, are but you said the risk. So well. is the risk level zero for the vaccine? Not statistically zero, not almost zero. Is the risk level zero? The benefits far outweigh the risk. But the risk level is not zero. I know you don't want to say it. I, I don't blame you. It'll probably cause a, a, a firestorm. But, you know, to be clear, the risk level is not zero. Um, Council member, as a doctor, what I would say is that um, all medications, therapies, vaccines, uh, they have some risk associated with them, but our job is to be very clear about the magnitude to which the benefits outweigh the risks. And with respect to the authorized COVID-19 vaccines, the science and the evidence is very, very clear that the benefits far outweigh the risks. This is both um, in terms of it being a personal defense against disease, as well as a community defense against the spread of COVID-19. I agree with you 100%. I think people should get vaccinated. I think the benefits do far outweigh the costs. That's your job to tell us that, and I think you've done a great job. It's our job to weigh the risk tolerance and the level of intrusion government will make. That's what a legislature does. Regardless. Well, folks, 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 there's Don't ways. cheer me on. I think you should all get your vaccines. There are ways of expressing. <laughs> folks, please, Guys. please. This is the council member's time. Please. Thank you. Yes, council member. So, um, just to go back, just to go back to another question, I guess. What happens to the classroom again if a teacher is terminated or placed on unpaid leave or whatever the consequences is. You mentioned the substitute teacher's pool would be implemented. Is it better for a student to have their continued qualified and licensed teacher or an assortment of subs who may lack those qualifications and licenses? I think it's important to note that we're in the middle of a public health crisis. And so it's better- Fo Folks, it is again, mm -hmm. please so have think... respect for the people's house. So I think it is This is a city council hearing, the Chancellor Health Commissioner here answering questions for families on the record. And folks, please, again, another outburst, and I'm gonna ask Sergeant at Arms to, to clear the room. This is really important for folks to hear. Chancellor, my, my apologies, please continue. Thank you. So as I said, I think it's important to note that we're in a public health moment, that we have to you know, I agree with you that it is more important to have a certified vaccinated teacher in the classroom with his or her class teaching those students. However, when we have to weigh health and safety along with our academic requirements to students, we have to keep them health and safety safe so that they can learn. How many cases in New York City public schools uh, last year while school was in session uh, were found to have transmission from a student to a teacher or a paraprofessional? So the, the, I'd have to, I don't have that number with me, but the greater instances was, were around adult transmission. Okay. But I'm just trying to establish, we, we don't, that, that's a number the city has? Or that's just a number we don't have? Uh, council member we can follow up on that to see if we have specific data um, in the way that you're describing what i can tell you is um, the city uh, published a peer-reviewed scientific article on uh, at least um, a portion of uh, the last full school year which showed that 78 percent of cases of of transmission that occurred within the school building uh, were uh, from adults either adults to adult or adult to children so that means the balance was 22%. So the estimate is 22%, okay, that's fine. Um, but we do, have a, we, we do have a hard number of how many diagnosed cases were from transmission in school, regardless of who the initial uh, unhealthy person was. We do have an estimate of that. Uh, in some cases, it is difficult to ascertain precisely what the source of transmission is. But it's, we have the estimate, and the estimate we're confident is worth it then to terminate or fire people um, based on it. In other words, we're, it, it was so high that we've decided that it's worth firing the same people that we've asked to do tremendous you know, yeoman's work and God's work last year during the pandemic 
So that number is high enough to justify their potential termination. It's a policy question, but we're policy makers. That's what I'm asking. So Chancellor, I'll, yep. I'll start yep. and, then, mm -hmm. and then hand it over to you. I want to be very clear that you know, the goal of the commissioner's order uh, that I made, which, um, which is to require uh, school staff to be vaccinated, um, is for health, safety, and protection. Um, our aim is to, is to get all of those school staff vaccinated uh, to protect themselves as well as to protect their families and the school community. Um, I guess my final question, there's, there's 50 states, dozens of large cities, dozens of countries with, uh, with similar health departments and, and capabilities that resemble our own. And I'm assuming the leadership is all as qualified as, as you, you both, Commissioner and, and uh, Chancellor, and I don't doubt you're qualified, and, and I commend you in so many ways for the work you've done. Um, but with all that stuff and everyone digesting the same corpus of, of scientific uh, research and data, there's still countless different ways people have um, structured their approach to COVID-19 and their response. Do you think politics plays a role in those choices? What we're doing is opening a school system so that we can get our children in the places in which they learn best. And I'm not engaging in a moment of politics. I'm engaging in what I believe is important for children as a teacher, as a school leader, and as the leader of the largest school system in the country. I mean, just given the fact that we have the state health commissioner now, you know, dumping on the last governor for not being transparent in health policy at the state level, are you suggesting that it's an unfair question to ask whether there's politics always at play in, in health policy? I'm suggesting that Dr. Choksi and I have been working to open schools. And what we've done is really look at all of the science around how to do that safely. And so what I'm suggesting is that's what I'm prioritizing and focusing on. Good. Thank you guys. And as a parent, I do, I do wish you luck. And I, I, frankly, I hope you're, you're right. I hope you're right and I'm wrong. But thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Riley. Thank you, Council. How you doing, Commissioner? How you doing, Chancellor? Uh, thank you so much, Chairs. Um, I think everything has been asked uh, today, but I'm going to emphasize uh, with my colleagues that uh, this year is predicted to be one of the coldest and longest winters. Um, as we're going back to school, we do understand that our classrooms are overpopulated. Uh, we are trying everything in our, our measure right now to uh, lower that uh, amount of children within the class holes. But being that this is going to be a very cold and long winter and we do not have a remote option available uh, for our students, is this something that should be alarming? Um, is there anything that we're going to do to uh, protect our students moving forward, uh, being that this will be a very devastating winter and we don't know if another variant may come alive um, after this winter? So I'll start and then you'll talk about variants. I think it's important to note that we're not offering a remote option. It doesn't mean we aren't prepared to go remote if we need to. And so we have, New York City has continued. You all have been doing this work since I, before I sat in this seat when I was sitting in the Bronx. Um, what we're prepared to do is to make sure that learning continues. And if the cases rise and we have to go remote, we're prepared to do that. We've learned so much in the pandemic around what we can do. That's why we're making sure that our students continue to have access to devices, devices that are Wi-Fi LTE enabled so that they can remain connected to school. Um, you know, we are definitely leaning into getting ready to open, but we are prepared to pivot should we need to. Thank you, and I'll just add, Council Member, um, thank you for the question. Uh, we do know that respiratory viruses are more likely to spread in the winter months. Uh, it's a combination of the, um, the cold driving more people inside, as well as changes in the relative humidity of the air that allows for the virus to spread more easily. Um, and so we have to bring to bear this layered approach to prevention that you've heard us talk about. But there is one very, very important tool which I have to reemphasize 
and that's the COVID-19 vaccines, which we did not have at this time mm -hmm. last year heading into the winter. Um, we have made very good strides in our vaccination campaign in New York City um, with uh, over 10.7 million doses administered, 77% uh, of adults with at least one dose, and as you heard me say earlier, 62% of um, kids between 12 and 17 with at least one dose. We are going to push those numbers even higher, and it is the most critically important thing we can do to keep one another safe, and most importantly, keep our kids safe heading into the winter. So my, my plea, you know, what I urge uh, all of us to think about is this is, if it's not enough to protect yourself or to protect your loved ones, this is something that we have to do for our community and our city, um, especially heading into the winter months. Thank you, Commissioner. And just one more question. Um, myself and public advocate uh, Williams and the Healing Center Task Force put together some recommendations that we did present to the DOE. So my question is, uh, did you receive the recommendations from the task force? Mm -hmm. Have you given any recommendations, yeah. any thoughts? And is there room for further discussion? Because I have been having meetings with other organizations um, that had some issues with um, some of the task force uh, recommendations, but we would like to sit down with you and discuss how we could better uh, sue our students who went through a lot of traumatic situations during this pandemic. Thank you so much, Council Member Riley, and thank you for your work and your efforts. We have received the recommendations, we are reviewing them, and we are absolutely open to sitting down and thinking about how we implement some of the recommendations in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Riley. Can we have the mic to Council Member Miller now? Oh, there's one there. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chancellor, Team DOE, Dr. Townsend. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Chair Traeger and, and Levine, thank you so much for your leadership this afternoon. Um, in terms of the Situation Room, we, we, uh, oftentimes last, last year I, I'm finding from principals, administrators, and, and the school community that they were just often unprepared and not necessarily had the tools and resources to my mother calls every time I go to the <laughs> You're gonna be in trouble. I'm almost, and I'm in trouble if I don't pick it up, but I'm, I'm gonna eat this one, okay? Um, and, and so uh, I wanna begin with, uh, you said that there would be additional situation room staff. Will that staff, as well as the existing staff, uh, be retrained, be trained and retrained in the new um, policies, considering that, um, Oftentimes over the past year that uh, administrators are waiting to 10, 11 o'clock at night to decide what, what they're going to do uh, the next day and not be able to um, uh, inform the school community as to what next steps were going to be in a timely fashion. How do we propose to address that situation? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, and I'm thankful to the leadership of Commissioner Laraca as we staff up. You know, I had mentioned earlier, I think the key is, is not just adding the 84 additional staff members to, to, the, to the situation room, but actually working alongside multiple agencies that have done this before. Uh, we were learning uh, last year as we stood up the situation room about what worked best for schools, what were those conflicting timelines, what were the things that we needed to account for as our agency, and those interdependencies between the health department, between test and trace as they ramped up, and, and the disease detectives did their work. So there's a lot to the communication path, but I think we gained a lot of efficiency, and we've been training on these new protocols that are posted uh, to make sure schools get the right real-time advice uh, and the policy uh, so that the on the receiving end, they're getting the most current information and the guidance that we have. So yes, that training will happen, and as we onboard folks, we're real excited to teach them where we've been and where we're headed. Okay, that, that, that continuity is important, and, and, and I was saying that what we were hearing in, in, in uh, my colleagues and I, that, that it wasn't a lot of, as a matter of fact, information, here it is, and um, principals were kind of working in a very ad hoc kind of way, ad hoc kind of way. Um, if a member of the staff tests positive and they are vaccinated, will they be allowed back into the school building and when? Yeah, so if a, a, a vaccinated staff member tests positive, they will be allowed as long as they are asymptomatic. 
the Dr. Fauci, you can't sorry, explain Chancellor, I may, I may have to I'm clarify sorry, Dr. that. Dr. I'm sorry. I, I believe the Chancellor is thinking about a case in which there is an exposure for a fully vaccinated person, in which case, um, yes. as long as they're asymptomatic, uh, they would still be in the school building. But in the case that you're laying out, if, uh, if they have a positive test, then they do have to complete their isolation period and they would not be allowed in the school building. Okay, thank yes. you. And, thank you, and, Dr. Um, uh, as, as a matter of re return to school policy, there, there is, uh, Chancellor, uh, your administration put out a lot of information and, and administrators are, are fielding questions from parents about yes. after school programs, mm -hmm. Saturday programs and so forth. We haven't had an opportunity to, to really have any discourse about that. Um, but certainly it's going to impact parents and, and student participation. Could you expand on that? So, you know, we know that part of the return to school is not just about what we do from eight to three, but it's about the additional academic and enrichment programs that we offer. And so we're looking forward to offering those as well. But we also, you know, have to lean into health and safety protocols. So we're working through what that means, what that looks like, how do we offer them safely? Um, how do we make sure, again, we continue to protect our students? Um, what activities may be high risk? What, what activities we may want to lessen? And so again, we know that um, enrichment and after school activities are an important part of our comeback and we look forward to offering them, but we're also looking at how we offer them safely. Okay, do, do we have a timeline on any of these programs? Yeah, we expect to, and I'll let um, Deputy Chancellor Robinson talk about some of our community schools programs. We expect to start offering them, you know, as part of our comeback. Um, but we, again, want to lean into looking at what activities we're offering, you know, how we offer them safely, what, what the timeliness is, and also ensuring that we're creating time to make sure our buildings are cleaned and turned around for the next school day. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I know it's a lot going on right now, but I'm happy to report that PSAL is back. Yes. We have our student athletes back. We see that as an important part of the mental health and wellness and keeping our young people physically active and healthy. Um, so they're back already. We'll have competitions um, beginning as early as the first week of school. Um, and for our high risk sports, we listen to the state and um, other health professionals and we are ensuring that for our high risk sports, our athletes have the vaccine. Um, our other programming will be coming back online. We will have more information about that you know, very shortly with our community schools, but also our other after school programs. But we've seen it through Summer Rising, highly successful, our partnerships with our CBOs and keeping our young people active and engaged in extracurricular activities, the arts, um, and other kinds of, of programming. So we're excited about that. It's very much a part of our homecoming and very much a part of how we view health and safety from a mental health and wellness lens and also keeping our young people physically fit and active while supporting parents and ensuring that we have that after school option available. Okay, but very specific because you mentioned community schools, will all schools K through 12 or um, have after school programs available to them? For our community school partners, that is a part of the model and we can certainly follow up for our community schools. This year we increased the number of community schools in partnership with council and the next school year we're increasing that number yet again. So, you know, hopefully I've heard you all call for every school becoming a community school. I would love for, to see that happen across New York City, but so more to come there. So, but that's not the expectations as of uh, next week that, that schools won't No, have. every school will not that, be a community school well, next no, week. No, no, not a community school, but have an after school program. Uh, whether it's local CBO or through DOE that will be available. I can, we can certainly get year. you the information for all council members and make sure that families have that information as well. I don't want to speak to every single um, individual school, but it is a part of our community school model and we're happy to get that information to council. But every, each, each middle school will continue to have an after school program, correct? Yes, we still have those programs in place. Okay, and, and I, I was specifically asking about elementary. That's not yet online. I don't think so. You know, we are, again, we'll continue to work with our elementary schools 
Um, and we've definitely been asked about offering and supporting them in creating high quality um, after school programming as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have two more council members left uh, for, for questions. Remember, there is no round two. Uh, also, just to note that uh, uh, I believe that the health commissioner has an important health call at 1.30, so if any members have a health question now for the health commissioner, uh, we should ask th uh, them now. So who's next on the queue? Uh, council member Brooks Powers, uh, please. Thank you. Thanks so much and good afternoon. And thank you, Chair Traeger, for um, today's hearing and for your leadership on this um, very important issue. Also, thanks so much to Chancellor Porter and Commissioner Chosky for um, your testimony today. Um, in the interest of the time, I, I'm gonna work to uh, try and avoid any questions that seemingly have been addressed. Um, while I'm not on the education committee, I felt it important to travel from Far Rockaway today to speak on behalf of the constituents in the 31st Council District. Um, I've been having a number of conversations with community uh, leaders, uh, education leaders from our principals to our teachers, um, as well as parents that have some concerns. So I found a mixed bag um, and uh, feedback which include a lot of parents and students being exciting, excited about the reopening of our schools, but having serious concerns still and um, with hope that we can avoid um, a not so good reopening as we had last year, mm -hmm. um, which is gonna require a lot of communication and coordination. And so I'm really interested in understanding a bit better um, what that, all looks like. So the first question that I have is, you know, as schools across the country reopen, including here in New York City, many are currently experiencing outbreaks. And so I'm interested in knowing if the Department of Education, as well as DHMH, DH, excuse me, DOHMH, conveyed plans and protocols to protect our students, teachers, and staff in the school system in the event of an outbreak. Um, because some of the feedback I'm hearing is that um, the education leaders do not have a clear understanding in the event of an outbreak or even with the reopening what that clear plan is. So I'd like to know from your perspective, has this been conveyed to the schools and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So I'll start, you know, so our school leaders are very much aware of what we learned over the last year. And because you're talking specifically to outbreaks, um, we are in the process of finalizing our closure protocols, our quarantining protocols, but in the event of an outbreak that leads to a closure or a classroom closure, we will pivot to a remote classroom, we will, uh, or pivot to a remote school. That's what we've learned how to do in the pandemic, that's what we will continue to do. What it also means though, is that there will be different levels of what that potentially looks like, right? In a elementary school classroom, how, that, how we will engage our K-5 students, how, will, how we will engage our six to 12 students. What we can promise is that instruction will continue for our students. We know that that is so important in this moment. And we've learned so much in this pandemic about how we need to do that. And so we will continue to provide support to our schools and our school leaders around what needs to happen, but we also are continuing to work with our union partners around the protocols um, that result in those moves and what they look like. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know, Commissioner, do you have anything to add before I go to the next the question? The Chancellor described it well. I'll just add very briefly. I'm sure, um, Council Member, you've seen the homecoming handbook, which outlines um, you know, the, some of the approaches, the protocols that were described. And what I would, what I would clarify is that, is that. All right, I, listen, th this, this, this is in, this, not, this is not just about, Sergeant, please, please, ha please have, please have her removed. Please have her removed. Yeah. Why are we not 
Folks, uh, S Sergeant, please have her removed. That is, listen, folks, that is incredibly disrespectful. That is incredibly disrespectful. Sergeant, 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 I'm asking, please clear the, the, the whole balcony. Please clear the whole balcony. Please, please clear out, please clear, clear out the balcony. Please clear out the balcony. Please clear out the balcony. You, please clear out the balcony. Please clear out the balcony. This, you, you, <laughs> folks, yeah. You do not have a right to disrupt an important public hearing over and over again. Sergeants, please have them removed. This is, this is unacceptable. This is. Excuse me, I'd like Excuse to finish me. asking the questions on behalf of my constituency. Uh, council, council members, we're going to have a, a three minute recess. We're going to have a three minute recess. Sergeants, please clear out, clear out the room. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is a democratic institution. It is not mob rule, okay? Uh, just uh, w w again, we're waiting for everyone to, to, to be cl cleared out. Congratulations. No, no, no. But I don't want to leave like abruptly because I want to leave a response. So. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll wait for. Yeah. 
Thanks, Dr. Tosky, yeah. for the save. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no problem, no problem. I forgot about the health screener. I know. I oh, out. listen. But I was like, crossed in like, what is this question? Like, I don't even know how to answer this. They say, like, teach them just life. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it requires a good health screener. I just blanked out. <laughs> I think I'm on the other ones. Eh? All right. Uh, all right, we're, we're going to have uh, the, the health commissioner uh, say a few words before he has to depart for a health call. Uh, thank you so much. Council member, I just wanted to conclude my response to you uh, to round it out and say that um, it's not just in the setting of an outbreak. It's in, in the identification of even a single case. That's when the protocols begin with respect to the coordination between a school and the situation room. Um, and we have had the benefit, as the chancellor was saying, of the last year in terms of refining exactly how that communication occurs. And we'll continue, of course, our Department of Education colleagues leading in terms of communicating that to schools and families. So, um, so and, and with that, Chair, forgive me, uh, I do have to um, leave for another call. I, I just very much appreciate your having a hearing on this incredibly important topic. Um, I'm, I'm it is grateful for the. It is. Uh, this, <laughs> this is unacceptable in this institution. Uh, unacceptable in this institution. This is unacceptable. That language, unacceptable. And let me tell you something, as a former civics teacher, there is no constitutional right to spread disease in this country. And quite frankly, the, the misinformation disease as well. Uh, Health Commissioner Toxi, thank you, thank you. Let's let's have them removed, please. Okay. Uh, we're just going to wrap up with the final questions here. Uh, please just continue, Chancellor. Thank you for staying in, in your team. Our, our apologies for this. Outrageous outburst. Please continue, Council Member. Thank you, Chair. Um, also, I wanted to ask um, a question on behalf of the parents that have children with disabilities in the schools um, in terms of their, in some instances, inability to wear a mask throughout the day. Um, how I think they're concerned about how they keep not only their kids safe but others safe because that may be a, a real dynamic for them as well. Yeah, thank you, Council Member, for that important question. And, and that question, which is just like wrapped around not only keeping your own child safe, but keeping the community safe. So I'm going to ask how Deputy Chief Academic Officer for Special Education, for Special Needs Students, Christina Fodi, to talk specifically about what that looks like for us. Of course, Chancellor, Chancellor and thank you, Council Member. Uh, we are very, uh, throughout this pandemic, we've been very aware of our students that have limited mass tolerance uh, for, for whatever reason, whether they're a student on the spectrum um, or they're a younger student. And so we've been training our folks to work with students on how to develop mass tolerance in small increments at a time. Additional PPE is also available for all those staff members where there might be students in the class that have limited mass tolerance. But the goal is to develop that tolerance incrementally over time. That's something that we have been working on and will continue to work on. And we recognize um, that the additional health and safety protocols that need to be in place in those classrooms are, and are working diligently to ensure that folks are, are well protected. Thank you for that. Also, in terms of, um, sorry. Just touching back on the digital divide that I know that was brought up earlier today. Um, I'm really happy to hear that um, DOE has 
um, ensure that they have enough devices this year. Um, Chancellor, as you know, being from Far Rockaway, what that digital divide is like in Far Rockaway as well as Southeast Queens, it's tremendous. Yes. Um, and so not only the students, but also the educators when they have to work from home. Um, I just wanted to kind of underscore the importance of um, having devices that are fully powered up um, with enough strength, because that was something that was emphasized to me, the strength of the Wi-Fi is necessary. So not just simply having Wi-Fi access to make sure that um, they have proper connectivity. So in terms of the devices that you have secured, um, was that something taken into account in terms of what type of equipment was purchased? So I'll let Lauren talk a little bit about the types of equipment that were purchased, but I'll tell you, we thought a lot about that. We thought about, you know, we started with iPads, that were LTE enabled. We heard from schools and families and parents um, that Chromebooks also worked really well. And so we wanted to make sure that we were investing in the devices that were most useful for our students and families, um, but also gave them the power and connectivity that they needed to do the things that they need to do, both in person and remotely. So, Lauren. Absolutely. Thank you, Chancellor, and um, thank you for the question and for your, your interest in this topic. Um, I would just add, uh, in addition to making sure that we purchased all of these LTE-enabled devices, which means they come with data plans, we also have hotspots available. Um, and uh, as we discussed a little bit before, we're working extraordinarily closely with schools to help them make the right choices on devices as well for their school community. Um, just to give a quick example, one of the neat things we were able to do this year, um, our extraordinary IT team worked with uh, schools that needed um, the, you know, the iPads didn't have the processing capacity for some of the applications that they needed. And so they did a really neat thing that I won't even attempt to articulate myself involving virtual machines, but allowed them to use programs that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to use on a device like that. So we're constantly trying to innovate as well and making sure that schools have the devices that they need based on their programs. Um, thank you for that. And I, again, want to underscore because one thing that was shared and communicated to me was that in some communities they have l more limited resources. So even when yes. COVID first hit and we had to transition to remote learning, um, there was a significant gap in the ability for certain schools to pivot to remote learning. So having had that experience and now going um, into almost, I guess, the second year of this, we want to make sure that we are being preemptive on this. And I just have three really quick last questions. Okay. Um, so another thing in terms of the vir virtual learning option, I know that you mentioned um, for those who had medical reasons, but for the parents who may not have a medical reason, but in terms of what their comfort is for their children, is um, there still time to explore having the ability for that remote learning experience for their children? At this time, we, we don't have that option, but what we want to do is to open up our school communities, invite families in, see and build that bridge to feeling safe and comfortable to come back to school. I understand the anxiety, I understand the concern, and we wanna open our buildings and really work together with families to bring our students back into buildings. And then in terms of um, when there is an incident where there's an outbreak and you may have students or teachers alike um, who are vaccinated, I know you said that if they're asymptomatic, they. Um, may test, but it's not required that they test to come back in. I think that's what was well, let me Let me clarify mm -hmm. and help me, friends, so I don't mess this up. If anyone tests positive, they will quarantine. Um, even if they're vaccinated? Even if they're vaccinated. Okay. However, if they are vaccinated, they have ways to test back in, right? And so if they, if, if you're positive, you stay out, you quarantine, until you are negative, and then we return in person. Um, but there's a difference for um, folks who, say that again? Right, folks who are a close contact, who are vaccinated, that have no symptoms, that may not need to quarantine. I, I just think that we've seen, um, even through um, 
following the, the science and the data, yes. that testing is very helpful um, and catching it quick and stopping the spread as well and, and, and being able to respond quickly. And so we also know that some vaccination, the vaccination itself is not 100% guarantee that someone would not necessarily get COVID. So wanting to make sure that everyone is getting tested if they're exposed or if they test positive, mm -hmm. asymptomatic or not, yes. vaccinated or not, um, is gonna be critically important. And it, it would be great if DOE, um, as well as DOMH, um, is able to put those like data points together and share with the council throughout the year so that we can understand what the trend is looking like um, as we go and we have something to look back to. And then my last question, and thank you for your patience and thank you chair um, for allowing this opportunity, is in terms of what I've been calling the COVID achievement gap. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in understanding from a cur curriculum perspective, and I guess it also echoes what Council Member Miller was asking in terms of the after school program. So in District 29, for example, I believe we have only two after school programs. What um, is being put in place to ensure that our kids are getting connected to much needed resources, um, to ensure that the gap they may have felt through this past school year is addressed because we know kids may matriculate out of that grade, but they may have lost the opportunity to learn particular subject matters. Thank you so much. And you know, just first of all, I wanna to say to the whole council and for all of the ways that you all have shown up to help support our schools throughout this last 18 months. We thank you, appreciate you, and look forward to being in partnership with you. We also recognize the importance of making sure that it, we are providing not only the social emotional supports, but the academic supports that our students need and leveraging all of the amazing resources from 100% fair student funding to the federal resources to provide academic supports to our students, but also really take this moment to make significant investments in literacy, particularly early literacy, which we've talked about significantly, to build a curriculum in which students see and experience them themselves and is welcoming and affirming. And so I asked Deputy Chief, our Chief Academic Officer, Linda Chen, to join us to talk about the academic investments that we're making this year, which are so important to addressing what you talked about. And, but I also want to say, and I have to say this every time folks talk to me about the gap, our babies learned so much over the last 18 months. And we want to lean into their brilliance. We want to lean into their assets to really lift up what they've gained, but also really lean in to bring them to the places that we know that they can go. So, Dr. Chen. Thank you, and thank you, Council Member, for really highlighting the academic work um, and making sure not only are our students coming into the buildings feeling safe, but welcomed and affirmed for who they are. And I want to also underscore what the Chancellor uh, referenced as it is so important, especially now, to make sure that we see every student and their strengths mm -hmm. and lead with their strengths. Part of what we will be doing this year is as a system, we know we also need to know what are the strengths that our students have mm -hmm. and also what are the academic needs that they also have because we are in a place where everyone needs to get additional supports. Even though, as the Chancellor said, our students have learned quite a lot, as well as the adults in the system, as to how to support our students. So part of what she has um, discussed are a few things. One is literacy. We know that literacy is the gateway to accessing all knowledge and content. And that is why it is important, not only as uh, English language arts, but disciplinary literacy in each of the content areas. Uh, my colleague, Christina Foti, mentioned earlier that there will be additional academic recovery services for all students with disabilities. That also applies to all students. It is important for us that we know where our students are, so we are um, measuring that through diagnostics and through um, data so that our students, our teachers, have the information about what our students know. So whether a student is a general education student, a student is a student with an IEP, or a student who's 
uh, first language is not English, are multilingual learners. We want to make sure that every student, we are clear as a system what their strengths are and what their needs are, and we are prepared to be able to provide what they need, just as we've talked for hours now uh, in this hearing about health and safety preparation. That academic preparation is also essential, so I appreciate you asking the question. In addition, the Chancellor also mentioned that we are making investments to curriculum that students for which students can see themselves in. While we will have curriculum in a few, in the, another school year, um, start 2023, until then, we are also making sure that every classroom has libraries with books that reflect who they are. We are beginning with that as well as professional learning and supports for teachers so they are equipped to be able to um, leverage the assets of our students. As we create the curriculum in the next few years, we are leveraging our student and community voices and how they would like to see themselves in this standards grade level curriculum. We are also, we have amazing educators all across the system, teachers, administrators, who know so much about who our students are and know so much about how to teach them well according to the grade level standards. We will absolutely also be leveraging their expertise and their voice in this project. This is focused on a curriculum that will meet the needs of New York City students with the voices and the supports of New York City educators. We are doing a number of other additional supports around academic recovery. Uh, you have asked some questions about the digital divide, um, and the Chancellor has also mentioned investments that we will be making as well for students not only to have devices and connectivity, but also the skills that they need to be able to navigate and research using multiple platforms to be able to express what they know and other expressions for, for what they know in terms of content areas. Um, in addition to early literacy, we're also focusing on making sure that we know um, what our students' assets are in their math as well, and that will also be work that will be done. We are providing supports for teachers on instruction, for core instruction to leverage that information to personalize for students. We also have interventions and we are providing training for teachers in those areas as well. It is very important to us to make those investments to be academically prepared as well as prepared socially, emotionally, and, and health. Thank you, I'm sorry, I promise one last question. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the next, the last question is, how will the potential class size reduction impact the ancillary services available to students? Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say an enormous thank you to the council for your support in this area. Uh, in securing the resources for the class size reduction allocation, which I think is what you're referring to that was included in the adopted budget. Um, is, that, is that what you're referring to? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time oh, hearing. Sorry. That's why I keep going like I'll, this. I'll move the mic closer, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I believe you're asking about the, the class size um, reduction allocation that was negotiated um, and on behalf of the council, um, with the adopted budget this past year, which was, and I was just saying thank you to the council for your support in that area. Um, through that allocation, uh, we will be hiring about 140 teachers for those 72 elementary schools that are part of that program. Those elementary schools were identified because they had um, larger than average class sizes, higher economic need, uh, and um, uh, we're struggling with literacy. And so in those schools, we've been able to invest these additional resources to free up time for those schools to focus more uh, on literacy and leverage all the investments that our chief academic officer was discussing. Thank you. Sure. And finally, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Chancellor. Um, nice to see you. Thank you for uh, your patience uh, this afternoon. Um, so, uh, 
I just wanna read from the DOE's website. This is the list of vaccinations that students are required to have. Um, all students from those in childcare through grade 12, the diphtheria, diphtheria tetanus and pertussis, DTAP, poliovirus, MMR, that's the measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, varicella, hep B, and children under five enrolled in childcare and pre-K are required to have the uh, Hemophilus influenza type B or HIB, the PCV, the pneumococcal conjugate, and the influenza flu vaccine. Um, children in grades 12, 6 to 12 are required to have the DTAB booster and the, the meningococcal conjugate men ACWY uh, vaccine. Um, when uh, the FDA approves um, uh, one or more of the um, COVID vaccines in the winter, which is what they're indicating that they will, um, for children under the age of 12, the expectation is for children um, as low as five, um, will the Department of Education require uh, the COVID vaccination um, for students uh, in, in our DOE schools. And I'll just say for the record, yep. my daughter's birthday is February 8th, her fifth birthday. That is the day that I will bring her in to get her COVID vaccine, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So I look forward on February 8th for that to be fully um, uh, approved by the FDA, and, and I will bring her in on the first day that she is um, eligible for it. Thank you. Um, so I will say that that is a health decision. And so I wish our friend Dr. Choksi was still here who could really speak to that and answer that question. We make the academic decisions and our health partners make the health decisions. Okay, so is there anyone from, from DOHMH here that could answer that? No. Okay, there's nobody else, no, 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 no deputy here. No. Um, okay, I strongly, I'm not gonna be here in the council um, after December 31st. Um, I am begging you mm -hmm. to require vaccination for students as low as age five as soon as it's approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, and um, frankly, I am disgusted by the display uh, that I've seen in this chambers today from members of the public um, and the misinformation and disinformation mm -hmm. that is spread out there into, uh, into the um, into the into the and in, in poisoning the well of the conversation, um, not only in, in this city but throughout the country, yeah. um, and it is incumbent upon um, those of us in a position of responsibility and um, as government officials to trust the science, to follow the science, and when the FDA fully approves it for students. It is absolutely um, essential that, that we do what's right uh, to protect um, all of us by requiring that vaccination. And, and I just want to commend the de Blasio administration as a whole um, for having uh, the, the courage to um, extend mandates to the greatest extent that they've been able to um, so far and really leading um, really is taking a leadership role for the entire country because uh, no other um, executive that I can see uh, has taken such far-reaching steps around the country. So I just want to thank, thank you uh, um, for the, I want to thank the entire administration, but I want to thank you as well, uh, Chancellor, for your uh, leadership uh, in the DOE. Thank you. Um, uh, in terms of, this is a, also a, a health question, so it might not, uh, you might not be able to answer, but in terms of um, uh, the types of rapid tests that we're able to access and use, um, if, I'm just curious if we have the ability to um, have access to a um, extensive supply of the uh, rapid PCR tests. Yeah, that's another question for our friends at the health department. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up yes. with them as well. Mm -hmm. um, because that is, um, uh, as a diagnostic test, yes. um, the, um, 
I think the most effective way, I mean, there's antigen tests and whether there's a, whatever balance there is between the rapid PCR, but there's so many options right now for rapid testing um, that, um, uh, you know, that in coordination with um, uh, a vaccine mandate, I think is, is, is the most effective way um, to prevent uh, any large scale um, um, uh, super spreading events or, or, or outbreaks. Um, and then uh, lastly, just in terms of um, uh, the uh, federal funding that DOE has received, um, is, there, is there a full accounting of the, of the COVID related funding that DOE has received and is that gonna be made available to the public? Yep. I've, I've gotten questions about that from, yep. mm -hmm. from uh, constituents. Yes, thank you. We do have uh, posted on our website and I'd be happy to share after the hearing um, a, a plan that outlines how we intend to spend the COVID funds and that followed not just obviously internal development but also public engagement as well and I'd be happy to share that as a follow up to the hearing. Thank you so much and uh, thank you Chair very much for your time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Chancellor, I just have very quickly just some, a couple of follow-up items and then this uh, will, uh, first of all, I appreciate you staying here and your team uh, the entire time. And uh, I apologize to everyone uh, that, uh, of, of what transpired here. It's unacceptable in this institution. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, just, I, I wanna note that, note that for the record. Um, just a couple of uh, quick follow-ups with regards to instruction during the quarantine. Uh, I know that in previous announcement with, with the mayor, there was a discussion about some new evolving guidance or information about that. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there something new here today with regards to, for example, what the expectations will be for elementary school kids, middle school, high school kids, should they, uh, uh, be required to, to quarantine, and who is responsible to provide instruction in the middle and high schools, because the teachers there are required to be in the school, yeah. and th they don't have the, the learning pods that you have in elementary school. So I'll let Lauren Siciliano talk about, we've been really working with our union partners to answer those questions, and I have to say, and I know because we've had conversations about this, the commitment to continuing instruction for our students um, throughout in a, in a quarantine is there from all of us. And, and Lauren can talk a little bit about where we are, but I just wanna say that I wanna acknowledge our union partners and their commitment to ensuring that we're working together to continue instruction for our students. Absolutely, thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chair. Um, so you are right that in the back to school booklet, there was some uh, initial information about what learning would look like during quarantine. Um, and today we've shared some additional specificity around that. So for, um, in cases where a whole class needs to quarantine, this will primarily be in elementary schools where students are not vaccinated. Um, students when they are quarantined and learning remotely will be receiving live instruction from the teacher. Um, so that will be the case for a, what we call a whole class closure. Um, as you think about middle and high schools where it's more likely that we would have more of these partial class closures to your point where some students are vaccinated and some are not. In those instances, as long as the teacher does also not need to quarantine, the teacher would uh, teach in person, the students who are still in person during the school day. Um, and they would also provide asynchronous digital materials for the students who are quarantining. Uh, in addition to providing office hours during the weeks of quarantine to support those students who are learning asynchronously, to set up small tutorials, answer questions about ex assignments, um, or help them follow up on the so work. So when you say asynchronous, are you meaning that teachers will be asked to provide some online material for the kids to work on, but that will not uh, that, that will not be like a, a live person with them. That's gonna be correct. Independent, independent learning on, on their own, is, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so it'll be a combination of those asynchronous, material, asynchronous materials as you just described, plus office hours with the teacher uh, during the weeks of quarantine um, to ask questions, to do sm uh, small group tutorials and things like that. And do you foresee or is it possible that some schools will just prepare 
worksheets or packets for kids to, to, to work on during the seven to 10 days, or all kids will be, all schools will be required to provide this asynchronous remote instruction. Can you speak to that? So all schools will be providing the asynchronous content that I just described, that's right. Okay, because this, this is something that has irked me, and it's not, like this, this is just in general. Um, when, when I hear some folks on public universe say like, you know, oh, just give, give the kids some handouts. Mm -hmm. that, that was not acceptable in my school, and that I would not, I, I think, I, I appreciate the, the answers here on that. Um, and I appreciate also our labor partners who I know both edu educators, uh, teachers, principals, school staff, they have been really uh, very uh, vocal on this issue as well. Um, question about kids who have to quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, will they have access to school meals? And what will that look like for them? Uh, because this is something that's weighs he heavy on, on my mind. Can anyone speak to, will kids have access to meals uh, during quarantine? We can make arrangements for grab and go options that existed during the pandemic. And so we'll, for classes that go to quarantine, we'll work ro locally with the school food manager to make sure that's available for families. Absolutely. Okay. So and just to be clear, so, so the, there will be, there is a, there's gonna be a plan for this, is that yeah, right? Yeah, so currently the, the school staff workers have met with the principals and have talked about where we're gonna bring the meals in the building, if not in the cap. And so we'll make sure there's set asides if we go into the, to a classroom closure or the building closure, those be made available at the building, absolutely. Will there be like delivery of, of uh, We During the pandemic, we did have delivery options, but we currently are not using any de food delivery options, but would be available at the school. Because if a kid has to quarantine for 10 days, I don't know if the food is like, sh that's shelf stable to last. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna meet with our director of food service after the hearing today and I'll get back to you on the protocol. Okay, I, I would absolutely, uh, appreciate that. Kevin, also just a question. The supplies you mentioned about masks and uh, sanitizer, other, other sanitary, sanitary supplies, is that available also to non-public schools in addition to public schools? The initial allocation last year was made available to all schools. We've since transitioned to schools themselves independently, including our own custodians ordering. So just to be clear, if a non-public school contacts your office needing hand sanitizer or something, is that, because last year, last school year, they were given supplies if, if there was extra, what's the policy th let, this year? Let me follow with the non-public office on their allocations and their supply chain management, and I'll get back to you. Okay, um, I, I will ask, I'll have additional items to, to speak about, because I, I know in the interest of time, I, I, I hear, uh, I, I'll be here to he hear all, all public testimony, but uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, this is this is incredibly critical, vital, important work, and I and I, I mentioned it at the beginning of the hearing. Uh, we might not agree fully on the issue of of a remote option for families, but I do appreciate hearing that there's there are, pre there are preparations to pivot because I think we all share the same ultimate goals. We want all of our kids and our staff and our families safe, supported. And, and, and learning and, and, and to meet their needs to the best of our abilities. That we all share yes. the same goals. We're on the same team when it comes yeah. to that issue, Chancellor, mm -hmm. to your Absolutely. team. And I appreciate and recognize the, the work of, of your team, your offices, and also the folks who have been very responsive to me when I, I've asked very specific questions. And I get very passionate <laughs> because the teacher in us care. You know, Eric, Council Member Dinowitz asked about air purifiers, about having a teacher moment. I, shared with him that in my school, I, I, Kevin, I was gonna ask you, how, how are they powered? Uh, do they get plugged in into outlets? Because in my old school, which I, I love, New Utrecht, if, if the microwave was turned on, my smart board would turn off. That's my teacher moment. Uh, I knew someone was making lunch when, when my board uh, would lose power. Can you speak to, to this issue, uh, Kevin? Yeah, one of the reasons we picked this unit is because it's efficient. Uh, and secondly, as a, as a um, part of the AC for All initiative, we've made significant uh, enhancements in this administration to upgrading our power infrastructure, and that's inclusive of Con Ed bringing different legs to the building so that we could add extra panels and run them to classroom. So we really, forgive the expression, amped up uh, 
this program. Uh, but definitely available in the classrooms. We'll make sure anybody that has any issues with cabling or such is, is resolved. But as of now, uh, they had the one last year and the second. I've been in many, many classrooms. There's not an issue with, with supply right now in terms of electricity. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you to the entire team for testimony today. Much appreciated. Thank you. We'll turn to public uh, witnesses in just a few minutes, but we'll just transition and get set up uh, for the public. So we'll be back in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, that was mine. You can have it. Take it, take it. Let me just say hi to Kevin Riley. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody one of these? Is anybody one of these that guy? Yeah. Is it still on? Check, check. Yep, it's still on.
Okay, if everyone can go back to their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started with the public portion of this hearing. And our first panel, uh, if they wanna go ahead and get ready, will be Henry Rubio from CSA and from Gail Brewer's office, Sean Jean-Louis. And just to remind everyone, so everyone is speaking for the same amount of time and it's equitable for everyone, the sergeants will be starting a three minute clock. It's right over there and it will chime when your time is up. And we just ask when you hear the chime that you wrap up your final thoughts. Great, you may begin. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Rubio, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, CSA. We serve, we are the 6,000 men and women that have dedicated their lives to uh, the service of New York City's children and their families. The vast majority of our members are the first uh, feet to step into a school building and the last ones out. Um, we are the principals, uh, system principals, educational administrators, supervisors of, and early childhood care directors across the city. And while we represent those school administrators, our constituents are the students that we serve, their families, our teachers, our other employees, our community-based organizations, the surrounding community. So when we voice concerns, it's not just from our members, but from the communities that we are intertwined with, that we shop with, that we live with, and that we serve on a daily basis every single day. And so I'll keep my comments very brief today uh, for the sake of time. And I'll begin by just saying that the reopening of this school year is, so far, with just less than five school days away, not much better than it was last year. For the same three reasons that we were plagued last year, they are untimely, unclear, and unreasonable policy rollout practices. Councilman Traeger, I followed your public comments, and you are 1,000% correct. We appreciate how often you travel the city to talk to school leaders, to listen, to understand, and to support. You, you have consistently shared with the public the concerns that our members have shared with us and that we have shared with the Department of Education since April on a weekly and monthly, ba weekly and monthly basis. You've consistently shared the critical information with the public that too often the administration fails to share and be transparent with parents and the public. For instance, when we talk about being untimely, You've spoken, you yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman, and other city council uh, members have talked about um, the untimely information about quarantining and what's gonna happen. We have been asking for this for months. I personally have been sitting on the table, and today for the first time, I heard what the Department of Education's plan is. I can tell you that as I sat here, I was getting emails that the Department of Education has now informed the public about their plan. As we sat here, our principals right now at 2.15 in the afternoon are in their buildings getting ready for a school system that is opening in five business days. And, they're, and they don't know this information yet. And it goes back to the root cause of this trifecta of trouble. Untimely, unclear, and unreasonable rollouts. Principals needed this information weeks ago. I haven't seen it. I haven't had the opportunity to review it yet. But in the little bit I heard, when are these office hours going to happen? Who are going to be the teachers to do them? How is this being paid for? All these unanswered questions are the things our principals need to effectively and safely run their schools in an orderly fashion. I commend you um, for the way you handled um, <clears throat> the episode that we experienced. And I'm, and I'm getting goosebumps because as, as our school leaders uh, most of them coming back from, from summer vacations and breaks that were well deserved and preparing for the school year, experience similar things when they hold orientations and welcome back uh, events. Their passions are high and there's a lack of information and misinformation. And too often our school leaders are left in front of a room 
being unable to provide their families and their communities with the answers that they need in a timely fashion. When we talk about um, uh, uh, unclear, there is still confusion from many principals about what exactly are the social distancing expectations from the department because it's often not in writing, conflict, conflicting, contradicting, or unclear depending on the district. And I'll close by saying, and I know my time is up, uh, when we talk about unreasonable, we've already talked here and you guys have asked phenomenal questions around uh, expectations around vaccination and testing that I won't rehash here. But I'll say this, I can tell you this as a principal, as a parent of three public school children, uh, uh, public school children, and my wife is a teacher, I am a principal. There is no substitute for in-person learning by a qualified teacher in a safe school led by a dedicated principal. And all we want is to have the information we need, the resources we need, and the time to adequately plan and prepare for a safe school opening. And that's all our members have been asking. Thank you for the time. Um, on behalf of every member of CSA and our president, Mark Canizaro, thank you. And I'll, I'll be welcome to answer any questions later. And I just, and before we hear from the next panelist, I just want to say, uh, as, a, as a teacher, as council members, chair of this committee, obviously, first and foremost, you would agree that it's all about the kids, right? Children, safety, learning. Um, and of course, as a former teacher, I, I, I love my education family as far as their, their incredible work. But I also know that it's the school leadership that, that ultimately gets, as you just pointed out, the last minute emails that ha or sometimes learns about things on Twitter or, or in, a, in an article or on television in the morning while they're in meetings, uh, that they are ultimately responsible to operationalize everything. Implement. And all the calls, all the questions, all the emails go to them. And if you heard my exchange today with the administration about a principal, I, I went to school to be a principal. I never was, but I, and I had the honor of shadowing a school leader. You'd be a great one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just to give folks context, school leadership prepares for the, in, for the next school year, not typically two weeks before, <laughs> before the start of school. Typically, they're, they're already planning for September, I would say even January, February. They're already thinking of hiring decisions, programs for next year. That's how it works. For, for, for principals only to get certain guidance now and still, there's still lack of clarity on some items, it's unconscionable. And ultimately, they have to advance an instructional agenda forward. They st they're still responsible to make sure that kids are learning, instruction, instructional goals are being met and, and expectations are being set. They observe classes, they have to then debrief afterwards, share observations and have conferences. All of that and principles, performance review checklist, compliance checklist, make sure services are being rendered. And now they're gonna have to conduct, particularly in high school, middle schools. We heard it here. They're gonna have to conduct contact tracing. The Situation Room does not know the schedule of kids in high school. They don't know who has second period history, who has third period English. They're going to call the principal. Um, and so, and I said to the chancellor, there's a cost to this. The cost will be instruction. The cost will be, and again, th they're incredible workers, but that means that's one less observation, that's one less staff conference, that's one less sharing best practice because they're on the phone doing crisis management, trying to make it work for, for the kids. And so I, and I also, want the public to know that, you know, summarizing finished uh, several weeks ago, principals in my district and I'm sure other parts of the city were still in their offices in their schools, planning, preparing, operationalizing for almost every contingency. You heard the chancellor today talk about, you know, we may have to pivot to remote. Pr some principals I know, I spoke, they're already 10 steps ahead. They have to. Because that's what principals do. And I, they've, some folks, they cancel their vacations. They postponed family plans. Some folks postponed even weddings. Um, and I just want to just acknowledge the incredible work, sacrifice, and service, of course, our educators who are family to me, but the incredible New York City school leaders who are, are just incredible heroes and essential workers as well. So I want to publicly just acknowledge that and thank you thank to the you. entire CSA family. Thank, thank you, sir. You.
please, sure. Next, please. Sure, go ahead. Sure. So my name is Sean Jean Louis. I'm the education policy analyst over at Gilbert. Um, can you just see if the um, if the mic's on? I don't think it uh, is. Yeah, it's flipped on. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll get a little closer if you can hear me. So I'm the education policy analyst over at Gail Brewer's office. I'm going to be reading in her uh, statements today and subsequently submitting a little bit more lengthy comments on her behalf to, uh, to the council. Um, my name is Gail A. Brewer, and I'm the borough president of Manhattan. Thank you uh, to Chair Chager and to the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify at this, morning, this morning's oversight hearing regarding the New York City Department of Education. Sorry, I think it's the, I think it's the mask, so. <clears throat> Thank you for Chair Hager and the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify at this morning's oversight hearing regarding the New York City Department of Education school reopening protocols for the 2021-2022 academic year. I'm here to express my support for the full reopening of schools, but also to elevate the concerns of families and communities in hopes that they will be recognized and respected in the form of a slightly modified safety plan. Um, first and foremost, I am in favor of including a remote option as part of the plan to fully reopen schools, as I do not believe the two approaches are mutually exclusive. Communities have been communicating this desire for an option to their CEC representatives in every district in Manhattan. Secondly, families have been communi communicating concerns to my office as well regarding what they perceive to be um, a lack of robustness in the testing procedures uh, that are planned for this upcoming school year, the feasibility of social distancing during lunch, um, the handling of and the quality of instruction during middle school and high school student quarantines and some vaccine hesitancy that still needs to be addressed as well. I would also like to take a minute uh, to address the school-based mental health allocations and initiatives. So on Tuesday, August 24th, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson was kind enough to join the Vaccine and Recovery Task Force that my office hosts every week. There it was indicated that the DOE is 80% complete with regard to the goal of hiring 650 mental health practitioners for New York City schools this upcoming school year. This was exciting news, but in a letter dated July 20th, I raised some concerns to the agency regarding the tangible measures in place to recruit practitioners of color and culturally competent practitioners, as well as measures in place to ensure that social workers will be receiving high quality supervision from skilled and experienced practitioners. I was pleased to hear that every district will have a social work supervisor, as I want to ensure school level practitioners are being utilized in a way that maximizes the use of their skill set and cultivates the development, their development in order to produce an even stronger practice. Lastly, I'm concerned about school level funding. A lot of money has been infused into the DOE over the course of the past year. Communities and advocates won major victories when it came to foundation aid and thereby fair student funding. However, a recent but preliminary analysis conducted by my office indicates that approximately 84 schools FSF allocations decreased in Manhattan because of projected registration losses, despite approximately 54 of them getting money allocated to boost their formulas to 100%. After their experience from March 2020 to June 2021, it is going to take extra school level fiscal resources to address the lingering trauma of that period. Once again, Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm appreciative of the DOE's effort regarding recent vaccine mandates and the effort to be in alignment with CDC recommendations. However, sometimes on a local level, growing and cultivating relational trust with families and communities, when that trust has a history of consistently being eroded, takes a little more than what the CDC guidelines have the capacity to express. So I would like to urge the DOE to take this into consideration to fortify their health and safety measures as such. Thank you for your time. Th thank you, and uh, thank you, and also to the yes, absolutely, uh, to the to the borough president uh, Brewer for really being uh, even before I arrived to, to to this committee, to being chair of the committee. Uh, Gail, Gail Brewer has always really been a champion for more social workers and supports in schools, um, and I know this was a very big priority for her as well. And we did make sure in the budget that there are resources centrally allocated, so it's not at the expense of a school's fair student funding to hire social workers for every school that, that needs one, that, so every school should have one. Um, and uh, we're, we're planning additional hearings on, uh, a hearing on, on that item as well, but uh, just please definitely send our thanks to the, to the borough president and, and our entire team. 
and also for your support for a remote option for kids and families. Thank you very much. And also my colleague um, and future, <laughs> future uh, uh, Council Member Mark Levine, please. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I have to say that I agree that the current borough president, Gail Brewer, has just been amazing on all of these issues, but particularly I'm grateful for her leadership on the social emotional supports that kids need, uh, staffing like guidance counselors and social workers. And not a question for Mr. Rubio, but I just want to add my voice to say thank you to you and your members. Uh, the principals in my district, I am absolutely in awe of what they have done for their kids and their teams over the last year and a half. Uh, I mean, just relentless, without rest. Uh, this summer was intense for your members. Nothing even remotely like a vacation. Uh, and, and the fact that they have been able to lead under these circumstances is an extraordinary achievement. So thank you to you uh, and your membership. Uh, you, you have uh, my profound gratitude. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brooks Powers, did you want to ask any questions or anything? No? Okay. Uh, thank you to you both. Um, the next panel, and I'm going to do my best with names, so I apologize. My name gets butchered often, so if I make a mistake, I'm sorry now. Joseph Perez, Crystal Katari, Cole, Cole, uh, Lori Podvesker, include NYC, and Dr. Devi. Oh, it doesn't matter, just take whatever seat you'd like, and we could just start at one end, and, and, and we just ask that everybody please just um, state their name and any organization that they're with before starting their testimony. And Cole, we can go ahead and start with you. And I was right trying there. to be third. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cole Aliel, and I'm a mother of two teenagers, so I'm here as a citizen. Um, I'd like to provide a perspective, oh my gosh, I can barely read my writing, which is woefully underrepresented in this room, and I would like to be heard, because I know that my opinion is a minority opinion. My husband and I have decided to take our daughter out of New York City public schools and homeschool her because she simply cannot tolerate masks. Follow the science with what we were told to do these last 19 months as our health advisors have flip-flopped, stretched the truth, and outright lied about so many aspects of the situation. I am surprised at how one-sided this discussion has been around more masks, more testing, and more vaccinations. So let me just recap a few things on masks and testing. If we're following the science, and not just popular science from the CDC and Dr. Fauci, then why aren't we paying attention to the science that concludes that wearing a mask is to a virus what a chain link fence is to a mosquito? It offers no protection against viruses because the particle size is too small. I repeat, a mosquito and a chain link fence and I want to be heard. But what is the DOE and the powers that be propose to mask our kids again when they don't work and they do cause harm? Oh gosh, I can't even read my writing. This is so sad. Anyway, um, they do cause harm. They are not a net neutral on health. Dr. Blaylock, a board certified neurosurgeon, wrote about this way back in June of 2020, over a year ago. In his article, he detailed some of the neurological and developmental issues with masking. But you don't hear anyone talking about that, but it doesn't make popular science. There have been several studies supporting the fact that they're ineffective, so why are we still masking? This feels like Tom Foley up here. I suspect it's because it makes people feel better, or maybe it's just a symbol, like Dr. Fauci said. Testing was another burden placed on our children because we had to ensure the safety of the school environment. We learned that schools are not significant areas of disease spread. And like Ms. Porter said, and I did the calculation myself, we're at about 0.3%. I thought she said 0.03. I calculated 0.28. But anyway, positivity rate at the end of the year. So how dangerous are schools really? And Mr. Borelli started the line of questioning that said, you know, if we're testing at a 0.3% positive rate, is that really unsafe enough to fire our qualified 
teachers um, who are licensed. The PCR test is the same test that the FDA has issued a future recall effective at the end of this year, 2021, because it's not accurate. If the test has been found to be invalid, why wait FDA and why use it DOE? Please don't say we're following the science. Seems to me like we're following the leader, though I'm not sure who that leader would be at this point. Perhaps the leaders we are following are big pharma who have gained massive profits throughout the use of these two weeks to flatten the curve. If that's the case, then I'm sure we the people will lose because both Pfizer and J&J &J are already convicted felons. Moderna just has a little more time to make up for this because this is their first commercial, commercial product for use in humans. Masking, testing, and even these experimental vaccines are no way following the science. We cannot run from a virus. It proves a wily adversary. Don't take it from me. Go listen to experts in epidemiology and infectious disease who are on record saying that we cannot lock down, mask, or vaccinate our way out of this. And why should we when, according to the CDC, it has a 99.997% survival rate in children? Don't believe me, go look it up. Why do we need to put children at risk of brain damage, social anxiety, developmental delays, depression, suicide, headaches, bacterial infections, staph infections, the list goes on. Just to feel like we're doing something. We just follow the CDC with their history of cover-ups and experimentation on the public. Masking and testing in our schools have no scientific grounds to stand on and you are harming our children. You mentioned the randomized testing of unvaccinated students only when the CDC has already admitted that both vaccinated and unvaccinated have similar amounts of viral particles in their nasal pharynx. So it sounds to me like a plan to blame things on the unvaccinated and vaccine status should not be a factor in who gets tested. I know my time is up. I'm sorry I had prepared longer comments. Um, I just want to say that there are lots of doctors out there who are not following what Dr. Fauci says and who have scientifically figured out new ways. Science is not a static thing. It is something that is always ongoing. Dr. Zelenko, Dr. Ioannidis, Dr. Yeadon, Dr. Malone, Dr. Bridal, Dr. Madden, Dr. Pilevsky, Dr. Blalick, Dr. Cowan, Dr. McCullough out of Texas. These are all doctors who do not see things the way that it seems this, um, this board does. Um, we've told our son, who, will, who does plan to go back to school, that we want him to take notice of how he feels. If his soul feels crushed, or if school feels like he's entered the prison system, to let us know and we will pull him out as well. You leave us little choice. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Laurie Podvesker, and I lead the policy work at Include NYC. I'm also a parent of an 18-year-old uh, who attends a District 75 program. Um, and first, I want to start off saying thank you to this committee for holding this hearing and an extra thank you to you, Chairman Traeger, for your longtime commitment um, to our kids and also your leadership and especially your leadership today. Thank you. Um, sure. So while we commend the mayor and the chancellor for their efforts to bring back one million children in person to classrooms on September 13th, we testify today with great urgency for City Hall to address the pressing educational and emotional needs of 300,000 plus students with disabilities ages 3 through 21 right now in New York City. Students with disabilities are among the most academically and socially impacted group of students within our public school system the last 18 months almost half of whom have not been attending in-person instruction in school since the start of the pandemic. 85% of students with IEPs are BIPOC, and we know COVID has affected these communities more than others. Less than two weeks away from the first day of school, we are still waiting for the city to release its official plans on how schools will address and make up missed instruction and related services, also known as compensatory services. Families need to know now how they best can prepare to be involved in the decision-making process regarding compensatory services with their child's IEP team. But this is not possible without official guidance from the Department of Education on the criteria the city will use when making these decisions, nor a timeline for when implement implementation will begin. It's also not fair to school administrators who need this information as soon as possible so they can appropriately operationalize and staff accordingly to deliver services. There's also been no mention of if and how related services, such as speech therapy, 
uh, one on one will be provided remotely for students with disabilities who will be asked to quarantine due to a shutdown of their class or school. Nor do we know if the same group of students should expect remote instruction to be taught by certified special education teachers. In addition, we think it is a misstep for the city not to offer full-time remote instruction to all students and families who believe it's necessary for their child and family, including students with documented psychological reasons that interfere with their learning, including trauma and severe anxiety. We also have concerns about students with disabilities having equitable access to pandemic recovery related activities. This includes the provision of round trip transportation from a student's school, after school and Saturday programs. It also includes the needs for our students to begin these supports and services sooner than the DOE projected starting time in late October or early November. School busing continues to be problematic due to a, time of, due to a lack of timely and accessible information for families. Policy changes such as bus route information is only available through a NYC school account or if shared by a DOE employee. The city no longer mails information to a student's home, yet many families do not know this. We also have concerns about the prospect of bus driver and attendant shortages, adequate OP sta OPT staff who can process and resolve busing related issues, and the overall health and safety procedures and practices for the 11,000 plus routes that will fully be back in operation. As a result, we recommend the following. That the DOE immediately provide written guidance to all 1,800 schools on compensatory services. That the DOE provides family-friendly parallel information that includes the use of visuals and is translated into multi-languages and available at the exact same time as English materials, unlike the health and safety guide that they released last week, which is only available in English, yet so many of our students don't speak English, their families, and just so not okay anymore in this moment in time. Um, we also want the information for families to be inclusive of due process rights and a list of independent non-DOE organizations who can help support them. We want the DOE to release more information on what remote instruction will look like for students with disabilities. We want them to create a citywide multilingual marketing campaign targeted to families of students with disabilities detailing the extra support and programs available, similar to how the city messages information on school surveys, preschool enrollments, and parents applying to local and citywide education councils. We want the DOE to amplify communication to schools and families regarding student eligibility for home instruction with an emphasis on students who have psychological needs and not medical. Um, by no means am I minimizing the needs of students with medical issues, yet it is a very small percentage of the overall group of students with disabilities. And nobody's, it's never cool to compare one group's oppression to another yet there's space for both. And it feels as if the DOE is not giving enough attention to kids with documented um, anxiety issues and trauma as a result of the last 18 months and encourage people to look at the home instruction website by the DOE which has this information despite their failure to publicly talk about it. We'd like for the DOE to immediately provide a date when bus route information will become available for families and for them to provide transportation and proactively plan for it for all students to and from home and school for all programs. Unlike this past summer with Summer Rising in which so many students did not, with disabilities did not have the opportunity to attend these programs because busing was not provided from these programs home at the end of the day. And the majority of District 75 students do not go to school in their neighborhoods near, nor their home district because there isn't an available program or appropriate one and we need to change that. Thank you for your time. And Worry, thank you for always centering a student population that quite frankly, to this day, in many cases gets ignored, overlooked. Uh, and I, I think you know my father's a retired D75 teacher and so this is very personal f for us and uh, this hearing uh, was largely about school reopening plans or in some cases lack thereof and lack of clarity, uh, but certainly we want a deeper look on the academic recovery, particularly compensatory services because of concern that I, you, have, you have raised here, but I, I've heard from others as well, um, is making sure that if there's Saturday after school programs and not cookie cutter programs, 
you need to meet the needs of, I mean, every IEP mandate has to be met. And at hearings I had last year, DOE testified uh, about 80% or so compliance rate with IEPs, that's over 40,000 kids that did not have, <laughs> that's, so, and, and that's just the full compliance. So I appreciate you, I just want to publicly say that as well. Thank you, appreciate you very much. Um, and, Thank you. Oh, so it's, Malcolm reminded me, <laughs> it's been a lo long day. Uh, we're having the hearing, uh, it's on the agenda for, for, for November. All right, great. Thank you uh, so much. I just also want to quickly point out that we have a problem with data and we will moving forward um, and especially when it comes to compensatory services because last spring when the city shut down all uh, schools from March 16th through the end of the school year on June 30th, the city counted any communication with families as related services being delivered and so there will be an intersection of that with compensatory services and I want to highlight that now publicly so we can figure out some solutions. Thank you so much for it. Next, please, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Devi Mumpia Parumphil. It's a very long last name. Uh, I have a few different roles, so I'm a parent. I'm a teacher actually also at a medical school and um, I'm also a physician. So I see two problems. I see a tremendous fear of the virus and its variants. We have a lot of parents and children who are afraid of that. And I also see a lot of fear in terms of the measures that we are using to combat the virus. So as uh, my colleague here had mentioned, you know, in terms of some of the mandates that are being used or protocols uh, to combat the virus. So I just wanted to say a little bit about my experience because I am concerned about what might happen this school year. So the first time when COVID hit, uh, so I have a child when COVID hit and the schools closed, what happened to me is that I immediately had no childcare. Now, whether schools are supposed to provide childcare versus education alone is, you know, debatable, but that is what another role that they provide, correct? So I did not have childcare. And because I treat patients with cancer, HIV, really in desperate situations, I had to decide if I'm gonna take care of my child or if I'm gonna help these patients because if I didn't help them, then it's pretty much a death sentence because they're gonna to have to go to the ER and at that time with absolutely nothing to protect them from the virus and no PPE, they would have died because they're the most vulnerable. So I sent my child away. I thought she would be gone for two weeks. I did not see her again for eight months. And I love my child, but I couldn't see her because I was constantly grappling with this same dilemma. So the problem is now parents who are in my situation are still grappling with this, that if the situation becomes bad again and they don't have childcare because the school closes or there's a positive test or this, this lack of predictability, they're not necessarily as quick to say, I'm gonna send my child away. They may say, you know what? I'm a frontline worker, but you know, we've had this much time to figure it out. I'm just gonna let my job sort of you know, go. I'm just not gonna do this anymore. So we're seeing this already because not just in healthcare, but in many frontline positions, people are giving up their jobs. On top of that, in terms of the measures that you were talking about, you know, there's a lot of people leaving. So for example, when it comes to the physician workforce, I just know that being a physician, there's about 12%, 10 to 12% is the estimate of women who have left the physician workforce. Then on, on top of that in Mississippi, they say 8,000 nurses, which is a huge amount in such a small state, have left because of the vaccine mandates. That's one of the factors that's been mentioned. In the past two days, California says it has a crisis because of the vaccine mandates, that it's lost so many nurses. Uh, South Carolina is another state that says it has a crisis. So California, Mississippi, and um, South Carolina, as I mentioned. So I'm, I am concerned that New York is underestimating the effect of these vaccine mandates. I think that we will lose a lot of teachers, not just teachers, but people who are performing all kinds of other functions, let's say cleaning the classrooms, um, serving the children food, all kinds of other things because of these polarizing mandates. It's not that I'm against the vaccine, you know, this is a different thing, but the mandates themselves that uh, will cause people to maybe decide between having their job or retiring or leaving. 
California said that they thought they would have substitutes come from other states to fill in this nursing shortage, and they're not able to attract those workers. That's the healthcare industry. The reason we're seeing it first there is because um, there was an executive order by President Biden that healthcare workers should get vaccinated first. So we're seeing it there. Because of that, it's not just the COVID patients who are having problems. They cannot treat people who are having heart attacks, who are having all kinds of dangerous and life-threatening problems. So I think we should learn from these other states who are having problems and prepare for a problem here, because then it will not just be the children who are suffering uh, within our school system, but we may see the whole city like as a domino effect, because if the children cannot go to school, then those frontline workers will stay home to be able to take care of them, and then our whole city may have a ripple effect and crumble. I mean, I now, I will also say my other identity, I am running for office. I'm running as uh, the Republican nominee for public advocate. The reason I'm running, I have never run for office before, but it's because of all of these things that have happened over the past year. So I just want to bring that to your attention. You know, the, the nature of the city council is we give the public a chance to testify. And we are very proud of that tradition. It's important to the functioning of this body to have open democracy. Uh, but I, I have an obligation to respond uh, to some of what's been said uh, by stating very clearly that amidst a pandemic of a respiratory virus, which is transmitted primarily via airborne means, masks save lives. They are critical, critical to our defense against this virus. The mask I am wearing, a KF94, filters out 94% of unwanted particles. If this is why we want the children that we love and protect, the parents who are caring, the adults who are caring for them, teachers and other staff to protect themselves and the people around them by wearing masks. I, and I did not say sorry, anything against you, no, a mask, sorry. Bill, you had, but you, I didn't you, say anything uh, against you, you a mask. You had a chance to speak and your time is up. I didn't say anything you against a mask. You had a chance to speak so and your time. Uh, but you uh, have mischaracterized Thank you. I'm what responding I said. to the other woman. You had a chance to speak and your time is up. Actually, you spoke more than your time. Uh, I, as, as for uh, or the, the attack on mandates, uh, this vaccine is stunningly safe. Stunningly safe arguably safer than aspirin. It is true that any medication or treatment has some risk. Yes, that is true of aspirin as well. But the benefits of protection by the vaccine so vastly, vastly outweigh the risks that it is urgent that everyone who is eligible get this vaccine. And as for, for medical exemptions, et cetera, of course that's gonna be granted. But I wanna be very clear that there are Virtue, there are just a, a minuscule number of conditions in which a physician would advise someone not to get the vaccine. There's a small number of allergies, and, and the, the more data we have, the more we understand that even in those cases, uh, the, the allergic reactions are manageable, again, under guidance of, of a physician. And this is a vaccine which has been given hundreds of millions of times in the United States. It is arguably already one of the most scrutinized vaccines in human history. So I'm putting that on the record to, so that no one watching this comes away with any misconceptions. And I am done now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, th I, I want to thank uh, Chair Mark Levin. And I, and I also want folks to, to know that uh, and I, I want to publicly say this about uh, uh, Chair Levin. Uh, he, at many times, even uh, the administration does not like his positions or views. He's unafraid because he speaks, I know from the heart, but also speaks to many, many uh, medical public health. I'm sorry. He speaks to many, many public health medical professionals almost on a daily basis, quite frankly on a daily basis. And I know that many folks, even my, my education family follows his social media, not just mine, but follow his, follow his 
uh, on the latest that he's hearing from public health experts as well, and he shares it immediately to get information out, not to get a retweet, not to get a Facebook like, not to cause a stir, but to, to save lives and to get the facts and the truth out there. Um, you know, I am not a public health expert. I am a teacher by trade. But I'm also a student of history. And I know, for, for, for example, uh, you know, in 1947, a couple years after World War II, there was a, a small smallpox outbreak in New York City. And smallpox, I just want to double check the figures, since 1900, killed hundreds of millions of people around the world. And it was actually a, vaccina a major vaccination effort in New York City in 1947, where they vaccinated millions of people in a few months that actually helped save many, many lives. And I would venture to guess, Chair Living, that since 1947, there's been a couple of medical advancements since that time. I know that FDR, the president, uh, suffered from polio, cripple, a crippling disease. One of the vaccines uh, that are required of folks today is the polio vaccine. Thank goodness that we've largely eradicated or have addressed polio. Um, I actually want to commend and thank public health experts that have been working feverishly to get information out that helped develop uh, such critical vaccines uh, using technology that I, I have heard has been already kind of available, but they just pieced it together. So it's not just it's not like brand new out of thin air. And, and so I, 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 hear, I hear folks, I, I, I hear the anxiety, I know it's real, I, I, I get it, and I try my best to meet people where they're at. Uh, but I do believe we have an obligation to uh, gather as much of, yes, the facts, information, public health experts around the world, not just here in New York, mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, it's not just here. There's, they're using, uh, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, in other parts of the world as well, not just here in New York. So I want to thank you, uh, Chair Levine, that, you know, we hear that there's a lot of, a lot of passion and anxiety, on, and, and I hear it, but I agree with you 100%. It's, our, it's, 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 uh, it's an obligation of us to get critical information out to the public. Um, and, 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 and I really do firmly believe that. And so thank you, I want to publicly thank you for your leadership on that. Polio is going to say has had a resurgence in, uh, uh, in the, Pakistan time is up. because- The time is up. But I, you mentioned polio. This is not I a mean, campaign event. That's had a resurgence. Not a campaign event. This thank is, uh, respectfully, uh, But I, that I, was because they tricked people in Pakistan, uh, if you look it up, to catch Al-Qaeda. Time, time is up. Thank you. We disguised ourselves. Thank you. Appreciate this panel. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Okay. Malcolm, can you call the next panel? Next, from, <clears throat> excuse me, from Girls for Gender Equity, Ashley Sawyer, Margaret Quincy, Medical Freedom NYC, Margaret Quincy, and uh, Catherine Katari. Um, we're doing panels of three. Next on the list, David, from the 51st Assembly District. Ashley, we'll go ahead and start with you and then we'll just work our way down and just everyone remember if you can just state your name and your organization before you begin your testimony for the transcription. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Traeger, Council Member. Um, I won't bore you with the background. You'll have a, you have a written copy of our testimony in your inbox already, but my name is Ashley Sawyer. I'm Senior Director of Campaigns at Girls for Gender Equity. We're Brooklyn-based policy and youth, organ youth organizing organization. Really grateful for today's hearing. We care deeply about public health and safety for New York City public school students. And so I just wanted to expand the conversation in addition to the importance of protecting young people from COVID-19. We also want to continue to press the importance of the pandemic that we're living in of racial injustice and in making sure that when we're talking about school reopening, we're thinking about the mental and emotional wellness of students, particularly cis and trans girls and non-binary youth of color. 
So this week we released a report called 40,000 Interventions and it's a five year look back of the School Safety Act data. As you are aware, the data made, was made possible by council um, and on the five year anniversary, the data is now public of all of the interventions of school safety agents in schools. Um, and the data is just really concerning and very alarming. As an example, black girls in New York City schools were 8.3 times more likely than other girls to be stopped by, questioned by, or interact with police in their schools. So that's more than eight times. That number is startling and it should be concerning to anyone who wants to think about a safe reopening that is fair for all students. And the, another data point that I find really concerning is that the NYPD utilize restraints, meaning handcuffs, whether metal or plastic, on students an average of six times per school day. So six times a day over the pa on average over the past five years, a student was put into restraints. We know that 51% of the cases were incidents ended in arrest and 22% were incidents of children in crisis. And so I wanna just continue and I know Councilmember Traeger, you have been a staunch advocate of restorative practices and mental health and emotional wellness. But I just wanna emphasize that as students are coming back to school, students of color are the ones who have disproportionately lost aunts, uncles, parents to the pandemic, disproportionately been impacted by lack of jobs, food scarcity, and all of the things that we've experienced over the past year. And it's so critical that they're returning to classrooms and schools where they have supportive, caring adults who are going to equip them with care and respond to their needs with gentleness rather than handcuffs or punitive policies. And so while today's hearing might be on a different topic, I wanna keep pressing our um, demand that we remove police from schools and in the interim to um, not hire the 252 new school police that are being proposed. Last year, we gave a report about the public health implications of school policing, and there's a lot of data that shows that it is really harmful for students academically, socially, and emotionally. I thank you for your time, and I um, just appreciate your advocacy around this issue. Thank you. Okay. I'm Margaret Quincy, and I share with everyone here their uh, concern about this uh, pandemic or this plague, whatever you want to call it. I, I see it a little differently because through my study and through my uh, research, I do a lot. Uh, it turns out that it's admitted that it was a um, biological weapon. And the virus itself, the, the spike protein, um, is not natural. And it does cause long-lasting harm. And that is what people are being injected with. So you can make your own, uh, put your own dots together on that. I'm part of a group called Medical Freedom New York City, and I'm very grateful for the council to call this hearing to give me a chance to air my concerns. Our group includes citizens from all five boroughs, and we are affiliated nationally and internationally. We hope that with information being shared, rather than censorship applied, proper decisions to protect citizens' health will be acted upon. On December 21st, 2017, President Donald John Trump signed an executive order to the effect that any persons or groups involved in corruption that serves to damage human rights and or which is judged to be crimes against humanity, either domestically or internationally, they would be arrested and they would have their property confiscated. I'm not sure if Biden has rescinded that EO or not, but that's probably for another hearing. I refuse to insult the intelligence of those present here um, by pretending that members of this esteemed body and the audience and the people who are gonna read this later that who have left have no idea what they do. That would be insulting. Though if you truly don't know what you're doing with the enforcement of these edicts, I encourage you to look closer. Everyone has access to information open source, even granting the massive disinformation campaign the shaming of those who hold alternative scientific views. 
the massive censorship of good information, the flooding of propaganda, and the constant lies which attend around the social and medical experiment on society and children of New York City. True science allows opposing views since it has the power of truth. Are the ingredients in the injection safe? Have you verified that? Who is liable for administering an unsafe injection? Will the council and the city be verifying the safety of the approved injection once the ingredients list is released? Will the council make a statement upon it? Everyone in this room is on notice. Harm to children, forcing them to submit to an injection which has failed to be properly verified as safe is a crime against humanity and a crime against our country and our future. Taking away a citizen's right to wit, to be secure in one's person, and to be free from having one's body seized by authorities is a capital crime. Is the purpose of the lockdown and the masking really to protect the, the citizen's health? Can you justify the actions upon these terms? What is the risk of having children unmasked? What is the children's risk from COVID-19 and the alleged variant, Delta? Have you looked into that? Have you gotten a second opinion? Have you done due diligence? Are you simply taking some sketchy agency's word for it? Shouldn't something so important be verified personally? What are the ingredients in the vaccine? Crawford. I understand Pfizer will be obligated to reveal the ingredients in their vax in one and a half weeks since it was tentatively approved. The, do cases merely mean a test reading positive from a PCR test? Is it possible? Have to you spread? verified that test? Does a positive reading mean a child is both sick and contagious to others? How dangerous? is COVID to children. If you could just wrap up your final I respectfully question. suggest, nay beg, that city administrators and city council present think long and deeply around their possible alternative actions at this important time, or anyone who reads this later. Will someone in a position of power have the conscience and act so that many lives who otherwise would be destroyed could be saved? To be blunt, the vax are killing and maiming, and maiming children. That is, the, that is the premise of what I am saying, and you should verify this one way or the other. The details of the administration are relevant unless your premises are correct. Your premises are taken from perhaps false sources, I humbly submit. Do masks okay. cause it's, cognitive, it's, social, uh, psycho psychological it's, damage to children? Ms. Quincy? The chair is just asking if you could wrap up your okay. final thoughts to be fair to everyone. I want to read the rest in. When the, when the bell the goes off, we ask folks to wrap up their final thoughts. Does the injection provably pro protect against the disease? Are we being lied to? It's essential to answer those questions. If you have the answers to the questions, why are people being censored? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commission members. My name is David Sepiashvili, and as an elected representative of my district, and uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of our constituents, most of whom are hardworking parents. But most importantly, I'm here to speak on behalf of our children. Uh, my message is very simple. We all recognize that our kids need to be in school learning. Remoting, uh, remote learning just does not cut it for them. The damage to kids has been terrible, academically, socially, and to their mental health. Depression and suicide among teens has skyrocketed, and no one wants to talk about it. But it's a, a direct result of the overreaching uh, closures. However, there might be instances when parents uh, do decide that remote learning is an option of, of their choice, for whatever reason. But we must, I repeat, we must recognize that it is us, the parents, who get to decide what we want for our kids. I'm here on behalf of my constituents uh, to speak about freedom of choice that parents have, 
granted to them not by any one of you, but uh, by the founding fathers. We, the people, demand that this committee recognize this simple fact. When it comes to remote learning or to wearing masks by our children while on school premises, or forcing parents to inject their kids with experimental medication, so-called COVID vaccine, by various means, such as shaming, spreading disinformation about safety of the so-called vaccines, or by our elected officials uh, while being covered by qualified immunity, lying in our faces that vaccines are safe. Uh, I stand here to demand that there be no forced vaccinations, nor forced face coverings for our children. So the choice should be merely of the parents. We, the people, will not comply with tyrannic policies that this committee looks to implement. We will not comply. Thank you, and once again, my name is David Saipiashvili. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Podveskar for, uh, did I get the name wrong? Yes, it's okay. For, forgive me. Lori. Ah, okay, forgive me. <laughs> T tell me your name again. Ashley Sawyer, Girls from Gen Girls Thank for you. Gender Thank you. I got the name wrong, but your testimony was excellent. Oh, thank you. And I'm grateful for your voice thank you. Uh, here today. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat my uh, previous extended statement regarding some of the other testimony that we've heard. I just want to say again, on the record, that these vaccine vaccines are extraordinarily safe and they must be weighed against a virus which in New York City has killed 33,840 people. Will there you waive your zero, qualified no, immunity? No, sir. No, sir. sir. You had your chance. Sir, the chair has the floor. This is a, these vaccines have killed zero people confirmed in New York City. Again, weighed against a virus which has had over 33,000 confirmed deaths. So there is no debate. There is no debate on the wisdom of taking this vaccine, and that must be the message that the public receives today. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next panel that we'll be calling up, Brenda Black, Josephine, that's all I have, Jay Newball, Heshi. Tischler? No way. Robert Kremer. Micah Beals. Jennifer Goddard. And Gregory Brender. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brender, and I'm here on behalf of the Daycare Council of New York. We are a federation of early childhood education providers, many of our members operating with DOE contracts, um, providing a wide range of early childhood services to children zero to five in all boroughs of New York City. I just wanted to talk about a few key things that uh, we believe are uh, would be helpful for the reopening of early childhood programs. We are, uh, early childhood providers are excited to open their doors, but know that we need to do just so safely. Um, so a few of the key things, um, one is we call on Department of Education to work with community-based early childhood providers to design proactively a remote option so that when and if it does become necessary to have a remote option, that we can ensure that children stay connected to caring adults, stay connected to their peers, even though we know in-person learning is better, if it is necessary, we want to be absolutely sure that we have the highest quality opportunities for children to continue learning because they obviously only get one childhood. Um, we also want, uh, we also are calling on DOE to suspend the pay for enrollment that's currently going in place with the new contracts for this first school year. Uh, we believe that with the pandemic continuing to rage, that um, we expect there to be volatility enrollment as businesses reopen and close, as parents' needs change. 
due to constantly changing situations. Uh, finally, we're calling on DOE to extend community-based enrollment, which we've had in place just during this summer for um, extended day programs. These are programs that provide a full day of care, uh, both during the summer and the school year. And um, we have just this summer been able to start kids in programs during the period right after they are cleared by their own program. This has helped to build on the strong connections that families have with community-based organizations. And we would urge DOE to continue that throughout the school year, particularly to ensure that as parents are returning children into childcare programs, um, they can build on the connections and trust they have with community-based organizations. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Chager and Chair Levin for all of your uh, work on behalf of early childhood and for education throughout the city. And we appreciate the opportunity to testify. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Um, hello, City Council members remaining. <laughs> I appreciate uh, your patience and your uh, calm. <laughs> um, very uh, appreciative. My son, August, I'm here as a parent. My son, August, I've emailed you, uh, Councilman Traeger. Um, he goes to PS216 in Sheepshead Bay. And um, I want to thank you for all the hard work you've done with the amazing principal there, Donna Neglia, to make his learning community so wonderful. Um, it's been uh, just the best school, I'm sure you know, the, the garden, the kitchen. Anyway, my son is not here with me today because um, we don't bring him indoors in large numbers of people uh, because of his health disabilities. He has asthma and an overactive dis immune disorder. <clears throat> He's prescribed a rescue inhaler and an EpiPen. Um, he was nearly hospitalized when he was one and a half years old with pneumonia. And he was also nearly hospitalized when he was eight with the flu, um, for which he was vaccinated. Uh, he could not breathe and the rescue inhaler was not helping. So thankfully prednisone and Tamiflu did. Anyway, um, but because of his health issues, he joined 700,000 other students last year in remote learning. Um, he also has ADHD and anxiety for which he has an IEP and he received full services um, while he was remote and he finished the past school year uh, with better grades than he has ever received in his entire studenthood. Uh, has exceeded standards in nearly every subject and he's finished reading two grades ahead of his peers. I don't know what I'm going to do come September 13th. So sorry. But I do know that I will not be sending him in person. Um, asthma is not listed as one of the medical conditions that was released in the DOE handbook the other day. Um, and even so, uh, ho home instruction is only five hours a week, which uh, to me is not an education, that's tutoring. So um, I've been focused every day instead for the past two months on speaking to city officials and trying to get the attention of the school leadership about the why, to find out why isn't the remote option being offered. I've been working with other parents across the city to try to stop and mitigate this fast approaching health crisis. And I've given public comments to the DOE at the PEP meeting two weeks ago. Um, I've spoken with the media. Um, and along with the Bronx Parent Leaders Advocacy Group that I've been working with, I've provided ample testimony as to why the remote learning option must be provided. <clears throat> the only thing I haven't done is hear a single compelling reason as to why in-person learning is the only option for my son right now. I've heard the mayor and the chancellor say that in-person learning is the best, but I've got four years of report cards that say otherwise. I've heard that children need to be in the classroom with their friends and a teacher. That's fair, but my son repeatedly say, said during remote learning that he felt like the teacher was talking directly to him and he felt more connected with her. <clears throat> We've kept him in constant touch with his friends via outdoor play dates or Roblox or Minecraft. We have the technology, right? I've heard the mayor and chancellor say that the schools were the safest, uh, but they're relying on pre-Delta data and when only 350,000 students were actually in person. So it's easy to say that. Um, so I've yet to hear a single compelling reason. I keep asking why. Why can't you offer parents like me this remote option? And you know, when you ask someone to put their life on the line, you need to have at least one compelling reason. You know, when you have people like firefighters and police officers and military personnel, 
you have a compelling reason. One, it's their job, they're being paid. Two, there might be a person in a burning building. Three, someone might be in the line of fire. Four, there's an enemy force, whatever. But none of these things are a 10-year-old child, right? So there's no compelling reason for my child or any unvaccinated child like him under the age of 12 to be forced to learn in person in an overcrowded classroom with questionable non-HEPA ventilation, especially when he is at risk to infection and hospitalization and possibly even death. Please use every resource in your power. I know you are, and I really appreciate it, um, to stop the mayor and the DOE from not offering remote and making us choose between our child's life or their education. Because parents like me are gonna choose their kid every single time. But then I'm gonna look into suing the DOE and the city for a 504 violation. Thank you. I wanna thank you. And if you can, uh, maybe after this hearing, if you could email me your contact information with, with your child. I, I'd like to follow up to see what, what, can, what can be done here. So please send me that information. And thank you for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Chair Traeger and Chair Levine for holding these important hearings today. My name is Michael Horwitz, and I'm testifying on behalf of Class Size Matters. The DOE's school reopening plan has many weaknesses. First, and perhaps most egregiously, the DOE refused to allocate a single penny of the additional $8 billion in federal and state education funds to lower class size, despite the City Council's dedicated advocacy during budget negotiations, and despite the DOE's own surveys finding smaller class sizes are the top priority of parents. Lowering class size would ensure a safer and more supportive environment for New York City students, particularly during this pandemic, given the need for social distancing. Instead of the $250 million that the council has proposed for this purpose, the DOE allocated only $18 million for a small program for only 72 elementary schools and has encouraged them to hire push-in teachers instead of actually lowering class size. This will actually lead to more classroom overcrowding and an even more unsafe environment. Not a single penny of the additional state foundation funds is specifically allocated for smaller class sizes, even though these funds resulted from the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit in which excessive class sizes led New York's highest court to conclude New York City children were denied their right to the sound basic education required under the state's constitution. Class Size Matters would also like to add our support to the many parent groups, elected officials, organizations, and this person sitting next to me, <laughs> who are clamoring for a remote option for New York City students, as most other large school districts have offered. Yep. Among other reasons, the three feet of social distancing that the DOE has promised will be provided at most schools will not be feasible unless many schools choose no, not to attend in person. Originally, the DOE stated roughly 80 schools would not be able to achieve so social distancing. The DOE then altered the formula they used by dividing classroom space by 20 square feet per student rather than 25, as they had originally done. Their spreadsheets also assume principal's offices and other administrative spaces will be used for classrooms, which seems highly unrealistic. They now claim only about 50 schools will not be able to achieve social distancing, but refuse to release that list of schools or say what these schools will do instead. Last week, the DOE released its health and safety protocols for reopening schools in September, which included mandatory masks, vaccination for all school staff, and social distancing if possible. The DOE claimed that every classroom across New York City will, has been provided with two HEPA purifiers, but there is a dispute as to whether this is actually true. Uh, but the biggest disappointment is the laxity of the DOE's COVID testing plan. Only 10% of unvaccinated students who have submitted consent will be tested every two weeks. Despite the fact that Delta is far more transmissible and there will be overcrowding and less social distancing this year, this represents a sharp decrease in COVID testing compared to last year when 20% of students were tested weekly. <clears throat> For those who might argue that weekly testing of all students and staff is too expensive, Los Angeles expects FEMA to pay for most of their testing program. In, indeed, as a recent fact sheet explained, the federal government will co entirely cover the cost of staffing and COVID testing for any school district. Thus, it is entirely unacceptable that fewer than 10% of New York City students will be tested only once every two weeks, given that no vaccinated students will be tested 
and some families may not provide consent for the others. Today, the DOE argued other layers of their protection plan will compensate for planned reductions in testing, but there's no reason the existence of these other layers precludes the possibility or benefits of also maintaining more testing, especially with overcrowding uh, undermining safety. Uh, thank you for your opportunity to testify today. Thank you, and thank you for your very important uh, uh, testimony on items that we actually share a lot of common ground on, and I think we certainly raised uh, many of the similar concerns with regards to uh, the testing plan, uh, the ironies between last year's testing plan being actually stronger than, than this year, and the chair pointed that out as well, um, and, uh, and the information gaps. Uh, you, you heard today that uh, at this hour, many principals do not know who in their school is vaccinated or not. Many families don't know that there's a portal that they can log on to to fill out if their child got a vaccine. Many folks don't even know about it. Um, but yet, a lot, of the, a lot of the decisions in terms of testing and quarantine center around vaccination status. So uh, there's, there, we have a lot of work to do. And again, it's falling on school communities to, to, to put this together, but I really, really appreciate this. And Malcolm, is this the, this the final? Oh, did Greg, yes, I think, yes. Yeah, I went. I went. Yes, uh, I just want to conclude and then I'll turn over uh, to my co-chair uh, co for remarks as well. Uh, today, I, I I didn't wear just my hat as a council member, as education chair. I really do look at things in education through the lens of an educator. And my colleague was, was a teacher as well. Uh, it's about the kids. It's about our communities, our educators. That's first and foremost. Um, President Obama once stated, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And we all, you know, and, and uh, there's an enlightenment philosopher that said, you know, I might disagree with what you say, but I will defend your right to say it. Um, what transpired earlier was not just about folks disagreeing, it was folks trying to absolutely shut down and disrupt a, a critical public hearing. And we're in the people's house. Mm -hmm. We have an obligation to, first of all, keep people safe. The, the incredible hardworking staff here who works in the council, our, our council colleagues, we have an obligation to keep everyone safe. A safe, respectful, supportive environment. The shouting down, the cursing, the intimidation against members of, of, the, of this body, the staff, the chancellor, the health commissioner, their staff, that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable. This is like the first time in my council tenure where I've had to actually ask the sergeant at arms to clear out uh, the room. Uh, this is not something that uh, members enjoy or, or, or look forward to, but we have an obligation to keep folks safe, to have a respectful chamber in this people's house. We can disagree, but we're, we don't have to be disagreeable. Uh, and, this is, and this is important information. A lot of parents, educators, are watching the hearing, waiting for transcript to get critical information that many still don't, still don't have. They rely on this to get information out. That's the power of oversight hearings, to get as much information out to the public. Today, we learned some very important things. There's still more work to do, but today we learned that elementary school children, for the first time I heard, uh, if they have to quarantine, there will be uh, live instruction. For many families, that was a question they asked me. Today, we heard on the record that the DOE will work on a plan to provide food access and meals to kids who quarantine because many of our kids and families rely on school meals for nourishment. That tells me that, that there wasn't really much of a plan before, but the power of oversight, asking questions, the chair pressed on about the testing plan needing to be uh, stronger, particularly with the Delta variant being more contagious. So, that's why we're here, to, 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 to keep kids school, uh, safe, school communities safe, to, to get the public informed, to do our job, to hold the administration accountable. Mm -hmm. But what transpired here earlier today was completely disrespectful, unacceptable, and not safe. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's zero tolerance for it. And I want to thank the Sergeant-at-Arms and, and the entire security team. 
I want to thank you for your work and for your service, for keeping us safe, and also for your safety. And I want to thank the amazing city council staff for their incredible work uh, as well. And, and with that, I, I will conclude uh, my portion. I thank everyone who came out to testify uh, to, and to really just to keep our communities informed to the best of our ability. And now with to that, I turn to my co-chair, uh, the one and only Chair Mark Lucas. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Well, you said it so powerfully and eloquently, so I, I don't need to add much. I, I, I'm really grateful uh, that we had the opportunity to hold this hearing. I'm grateful for your leadership today and, and always. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, there was important information that needed to get out that now is in the public sphere. We have to do more work to make sure that it reaches the ears of every parent and every staff member. We have more work to do collectively to keep our cities, our cities safe, our schools safe, our kids safe. And it's unfortunate that uh, there was an attempt to derail this hearing by, uh, by people who are pushing policies which will demonstrably harm our kids. Um, but I'm proud that uh, every member of this council, every member of the administration has stood united in defense of masking and vaccinations because these measures save lives. That is our takeaway. Thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.